dogs the way human beings. It, although it's a fantasy, it was related to a very large number of stories that I wrote which were not precisely fantasies and were simply not marketable because they were neither fantasies, they had no fantasy premise, nor were they realistic. And what I called them was interior projection stories. And I tried to explain, I already had, uh, by that time I had Scott Meredith as my agent, and he couldn't sell them and didn't want to handle them. And I tried to explain what what I was trying to do, and that was I was showing each person with a, a different world, and the contents of that world consisting to a large degree of material from his own mind. Hey, dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth beaming straight from all over California to your brain hole. We have replaced Langhorn with our civil acra today, and it's set on angry. So uh, hopefully we will get through this without the tape inside our Langhorn simulacra running out. Um, anywho, we are your personal dickheads. I am David Agronoff. I am author of Punk Rock Ghost Story and Goddamn Killing Machines. And um, with us today uh, are your traditional dickheads. Anthony, tell the folks who you are. Oh, hey, I'm Anthony Trevino, uh, co-author of the now-released Hissers Part 3 with Ryan C. Thomas. Uh, and yeah, I'm also a literary and film critic. You can find my stuff at various places on the internet. And yeah. Yeah, and uh, that is a good reminder. Uh, well, we have a Patreon, but um, for... Uh, for Anthony and I, we'd like you, if you want to support our work, go buy our books. That's, that's one way you can really help us. Or uh, and you can buy them directly from me if you hate Amazon. So yeah, there you, you know, go. Um, just buy them from me. And uh, uh, your other traditional dickhead, uh, Langhorn J. Tweed. Tell the folks who you are. I'm Langhorn J. Tweed. Thank you, Langhorn. All right, and our special guest today, returning to the Dickheads podcast by popular demand, is David Gill. And uh, Mr. Gill wrote his master thesis on Dick's novel, Time Out of Joint. He's the originator of the Total Dickhead blog, and he has been a uh, source talking about Philip K. Dick in articles in New York Times, Salon, io9, and NPR. But if you have not listened to his interview that uh, we did here on Dickheads, then you must go back and listen to that episode. We wanted to have Gil back because he is um, a huge fan of the novel we are covering today, We Can Build You. Uh, welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Good to be here. Welcome. You are way more qualified than we are to talk oh, about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're... Uh, very glad to have you here. Uh, we're going to, of course, start off as we always do with the PKD news. Um, and the, the first news item is he is still not with us. Um, but the second news item is that, uh, and this seems really weird that this would be a news item, but um, Elon Musk tweeted, and I quote on June 14th, uh, could turn out to be one big Philip K. Dick joke in the end. Like, no context before or after that. That's just what he tweeted. <laughs> um, and before that reason, Philip K. Dick was one of the most searched items on Google for 24 hours um, after that. So I know it doesn't seem like it would be like a big news item that just some rich brat um, like uh, tweets about him, but... The fact that so many people were interested during that day, um, of course, we won't know if there was a uptick in sales of books or whatever, but I thought it was interesting. What do you guys think about the fact that uh, for, for 24 hours, Philip K. Dick was one of the most Googled names on the planet? Well, at least part of that was Elon Musk Googling who is Philip K. Dick, so he could <laughs> make the joke, right? <laughs> yeah. My only contribution is that uh, reading We Can Build You, I thought of Sam Barrows as Elon yes. Musk. And, yes. Yeah. And uh, Pris is Grimes, basically. Oh. <laughs> All I thought about while reading this book. <laughs> right. Well, um, uh, Dave and I had that whole discussion that exact day um, that it happened. Like, um, uh, that Sam Barrows, because I was right, I was reading this. I read this book 
uh, several weeks early. And so I was reading <laughs> this book right when it happened. So the Sam Burroughs thing was was was, was uh, a little on the nose, but it was there. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. I mean, it was practically handed to me that way, David, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and totally. And, and I do think that it's kind of interesting and cool thing that and, and that for one day that that was a thing that was going on. And then, then it makes you think, too, like it's interesting how we think everybody knows Blade Runner and Minority Report. And you can, when somebody says, who's Philip K. Dick, you can obviously point to those things. But it was interesting that for 24 hours, that was that was kind of well, the thing. Well, see, to us and, and, and other writers and other readers of just science fiction and in general, I just assume everyone knows who Philip K. Dick is. But when people, like in my day job, ask me, what's your podcast about? I say, oh, it's Philip K. Dick. We talk about his work, his life. And they go, who? And I go, never mind. Did you watch Blade Runner? <laughs> yes. The book they adapted, that's adapted from one of his books. Oh. And then they're completely disinterested. So. Yeah, I usually yeah, get Once you say book, most people <laughs> totally shut up. Yeah, I, I, I can gauge it in five seconds. I just say Blade Runner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I do Which, the trifecta. I, I say Blade Runner, Minority Report, and Total Recall. Is what I, and I'd say I'd say screamers, but they'll just give me the same dumb look. So. <laughs> and right. What you don't know the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge? Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. yeah as I push my glasses up. <laughs> so. Right, right. Um, yeah, and then uh, a lot of times you can just tell the pink laser beam story, and then they're like, okay. Um, well, I would be willing to bet five thousand dollars that Elon Musk has not read Martian Time Slip. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't bet against that. Yeah, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> well, he wouldn't you know, make it past uh, the first three pages of that. Yeah, but I would say I I I'm guessing at being that he's like Mr. Mars now that he's at least probably read like the Kim Stanley Robinson trilogy. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. I bet he's read those, but I don't think you're. I think you're right. I don't think he's. I don't. I think he would probably have just seen the movies and thought. You know, he knows. Um, well, he, he also tweeted something to the effect of science fiction doesn't have to be fiction forever. And it suggested a very naive understanding of science fiction as merely a, a genre of technologies that would right. one day be achieved rather than a metaphorical field that you can use to dive even deeper into the human condition. Thank you. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, a base level um, attitude towards science fiction. Imagine that. Anyways, um, so uh, why don't we get on to uh, the reason for the season? So uh, this was after a long stretch of PKD uh, not publishing from early 1970. There was basically a two year period until um, this book, We Can Build You, appeared in 1972. Langhorn. Yeah, what? What, David, what was happening in 1972? Okay, there you go, you're lying. Well, Atari released Pong uh, in 1972. And um, a young upstart director named Stanley Kubrick released Clockwork Orange. And uh, Richard Nixon uh, went to China. 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 And Apollo 16 lands on the moon for the very last time. The Munich massacre happened at the Olympics. And the Watergate controversy, the break-in of the Watergate happened. So... Quite a year. Yeah. And on top of that, two of our panelists were born. So, like. Nice. Right? That, that you can see in two different versions how old this book would look if it was a person. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So, um, yeah, we can build you. Uh, let's get into the writing and publication history. Yeah. So, um, as far as we could tell, well, it was published in July 1972, and um, it was finished in October of 1962. So, it, had, it 
it and languished it, the marin marinate. It marinated in the uh, slush pile in the Dude, slush piles at SMLA for ten years. Um, it was the first book that Dick wrote after Man in the High Castle. That's important. Yep. And before Martian Time Slip. Mm -hmm. and, and why is it important that it's in that trilogy of books? Uh, because this is the period where um, Phil had his, Yarika, I have discovered a new way to do science fiction. And he thought he was creating this new kind of literary crossover style of science fiction and art house kind of literature. And uh, he was, of course, very validated in that with Man in the High Castle going on to win the Hugo. Um, and as validated as he was with the had Martian time slip and um, We Can Build You, which had a different title, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, like getting rejected by basically everyone on the planet um, who had the who had it in front of them was almost as soon as the validation came for High Castle, uh, the um, the crushing defeat, and we'll have a bunch of quotes about that um, of of this book being rejected was a huge deal. And Martian Time Slip, by the way, got rejected famously by Wolheim, and remember the reason for that was is that uh, Dick refused to move the year that it took place. Yeah. yeah. Well, imagine in today's world, right, you win the Hugo, and then the next month you take a novel to your agent and they say, sorry, I can't no. sell it. <laughs> Wouldn't happen, right? So no, it's not a at all. Never sell anything then. Um, it was not published until 1969 when it was published in um amazing um in its entirety serialized over two right. issues okay yeah november of 1969 and january 1970 and amazing so it's over two issues um now guys since you know philip k dick always turns in his novels with these awesome titles <laughs> The first original title for We Can Build You um, was The First in Your Family. Oh, yeah. What do you think okay. of that? Anthony, for those who are listening at home. I do not care for it. I still, I still, I like it more than the, the Earth's diurnal core yeah. rotation or whichever one that was. Yeah, it's but not the worst, but it's... Uh, not the worst, but it's not the best. No. What about A. Lincoln Simulacrum? Right? Are you going to get to that one? <laughs> yes. That was the title that it was. I, I kind of like that a, one. That one's a little kitschy. A period Lincoln? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With, and which then we dump him off on the side of the road, never to return. No, it's uh, the title is, a, is an, an Arnoldism. We can build you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty great. Yeah, I mean... Um, Mm, okay, so it appeared in. I do like this title. I will say this is this is a great title for. Yeah. We can build you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can build you is a great title. We I get it kind of confused with we can remember it for you wholesale only yeah. because yeah. there's you know we cans in there, but which I like both those titles a lot. So right. So um, <laughs> so here's the thing. It was published initially in Amazing over these two issues and. Here's the thing, the editor at the time, Ted White um, of Amazing, who took over for, which by the way, if you listen to recently, um, Alec Neville Lee, uh, uh, one time guest on our podcast, uh, just recently put up a two hour interview with um, Barry Maltzberg, who's also been on our show, and this inter on YouTube, and if you listen to this interview, he kind of tells the story of how Ted White got the job at Amazing taking over from Barry Maltzberg because Barry Maltzberg had the job very briefly, right? And that Ted White took the job over from Barry Maltzberg. So, but Ted White, the reason why he and Barry were kind of like switching places at Amazing is because they both worked at SMLA at different times reading Slush Pile. So right. the reason why Ted White knew that Abraham Lincoln, Simulacra, first in your family was out there and wasn't being used is because he worked 
at the literary agency trying to find or, or reading Slush Pile, and he knew that Phil had a novel out there. Um, and so I think he was the one that was like, hey, if you're not doing anything with that, I'll put it in Amazing. And so it wasn't submitted to Amazing. Ted White sought it out. Now, here's where the controversy begins with Senior Ted White. Because, and, um, and Dave is going to be able to explain a little bit more of this because he wrote about it extensively on his blog. So most of what I know is from the source right here. <laughs> but, uh, but when Ted White wanted to do it and amazing, the one thing he did was he, he basically told Phil, like, hey, I want to do it, but um, I think there should be an ending. Like, stories sometimes it's good to have an ending, right? <laughs> and um, Phil at first basically was like, well, what do you have in mind? Or they traded letters. And Te I, I don't know exactly how it went down, but basically he, he suggested to Ted White to actually just finish it. And Ted White wrote a 3,000 word ending to it. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And so the version in, that was serialized and amazing has an ending. Dave, would you want to maybe correct me on that? Or that's, that's as far as I know, that's it. They're, they didn't even exchange letters. Ted White was like, I can run this if I can write a different ending. Dick said, show me the ending. He showed him the ending. I think Dick changed one word or something like that. <laughs> changed the sentence. Changed the sentence. And then that was it. They, they were done. And um, Which... Yeah. Now, we've all seen examples of times where Phil has said one thing and then done another thing later. Yeah. Well, this came back to bite uh, Mr. Ted White in the behind because um, Phil changed one sentence, but then once he read it, apparently, uh, was very angry that, um, that, oh, it really seems like Ted doesn't think I can finish my own stories. <laughs> and then he decided that, you know what, we're going to publish this at, um, we're going to publish this without this 3000 word ending. So he went with his original non ending. Well, I got to know what is the ending? Yeah. What's this? Uh, uh Dave, <coughs> Dave, give, give more detail on that. The ending is essentially Lewis Rosen gets picked up at the side of the road. He's driving along. I can't remember who he's talking to somebody at the firm and they say, Oh, by the way, you're the robot. That was you the whole time. You were the, you were our test or something like that. Oh, okay. okay. So Lewis, Lewis right, Rosen was, a, was the robot and didn't know it. I kind of thought that was going to happen. Yeah. So did the I. whole time I thought that might happen. It's set up really like page 11. And he's like, well, how do I know that's not, Louis Rose the first, in the first time he goes to the shrink, he's like, yeah. oh, what if I'm the robot? Yeah. I'm the robot. Huh? What do you think of that? Yeah. <laughs> um, personally, I like that ending better. At least it's, it's a ending. I mean, yeah. uh, for me, this book is, it's a little, ends, bit, it's a little honest, a sad this trombone book, ending, but it's, it's not, it's not too bad. The what? book ends for me when he hallucinates with Pris. And then after that, I was done. Yeah. That's, that's where the book, that, that, that really I think like is where the, the book should have stopped. I, I was a big fan of the hallucinations. Well, and the other problem is he never wraps up what the deal is with these robots who are set out into the world, who are the interesting characters and have an interesting dilemma in front of them, and they're just yeah. left to twist in the wind. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the details um, of the are in um, only apparently real Paul Williams' book um, as far as... So after High Castle gets... Um, published and is successful there's like a four month period where smla like submits it all over the place uh first to putnam who did i believe did man in the high castle and then um putnam double day simon and schuster valentine and crown um a bunch of hardcover publishers trying to build off the strength and the success of man in the high castle they all basically said no wow and um, my thought is that um, um, Wolheim probably wouldn't have published this in 72 if it wasn't for the fact that he was just kickstarting um, Daw, you know, Don A. Wolheim books. Um, and if he wasn't in the first year, um, this was, it wasn't Daw's first book but they did an anthology first but it was within the first couple of months of Daw being an actual publisher 
And so if he wasn't desperate, because you remember he broke away from Ace, um, and we when we had Betsy Wolheim on, she told a lot of these stories about the, the kind of legal battles that they had, and and Don was like basically starting from nothing. But um, and when when he was starting Daw, he basically needed he needed work to come out. So I think the fact that he probably I imagine he probably contacted Phil and said do you have anything? And I don't think Phil was in the position to crank out a novel like he did in the past, but Hey, I've got this, uh, Abraham Lincoln simulacra first in family. Um, and then I'm sure well, I was like, yes, let's, let's go, let's do it. Um, let's come up with a better title. Um, I also get the sense that part of it was there to Android's dream of electric sheep was commercially successful. Like it didn't get, it didn't win an award, but I think it put Dick's name back on the map, and I think people read that. And so when he could say, "I got another robot book for you, Don," mm -hmm. that that was part of it. So the irony here, from my perspective, is that this is a book that Dick essentially cannibalized elements of to write to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and okay. then so essentially, like the prequel gets published like as the sequel on the merits of the novel that was cannibalized uh, that was turned into see what i'm saying it loses yeah well uh, oh so that's what i was saying too is uh, maybe it's, he wasn't trying to uh do a universe but there are those elements like the just the name pris yeah. showing up is is and rose is another book well, this is the rosen yeah. family which is what the which is this it's, yeah it's, it's, yeah the free tyrell name and, yeah right so um anthony i had this quote from ted white about like the situation between him and phil Ted White said, heard about the novel from someone at Scott Meredith, maybe from when I worked there, or perhaps later, I no longer recall. And when I became editor of Amazing, I asked for it. Scott was glad to send it out. It had been unsold for 10 years by then, perhaps the only remaining unsold SF property of Phil's. I read it and realized what the problem was, and I asked Phil about two things. Changing the title to A. Lincoln, Simulacrum, my choice, and adding an ending. So I called Phil up, he had no objection to my proposed title change, and he suggested I write the ending to the novel. I counter-suggested that I write a first draft and send it to him for him to rewrite, and he agreed. So I wrote a somewhat off-the-wall final chapter in skeletal form. I expected Phil to either reject it out of hand or rewrite it and flesh it out. He did neither. He returned it to me with three words changed and praised its economy. As far as I knew, when I ran A. Lincoln Simulacrum, it was in a form satisfactory to Phil because I considered myself a friend of Phil's. I tried to do more for him. I knew the novel had been rejected by every market that had seen it, and that undoubtedly included Ace, his original publisher. But 10 years had passed, and now it had an ending, so I gave a copy to Terry Carr, who was then editor of the Ace Specials. He didn't like it, but passed it on to Don Wilhelm, who had rejected the original version, who also refused it. However... After Don went to Daw, he must have had second thoughts because he bought it for Daw and published it under a third title, We Can Build You, sans my ending. Yeah. So that's a, that's a lot of details there. But my favorite thing is, well, you know, I knew it had been rejected by everybody. So, you know, hey, I'll do it. <laughs> but So I, I just have a question for Dave. Uh, the other thing that, that stood out to me is that Frauen Zimmer is a name that's used in the simulacra or the simulacra, okay. uh, as the person that, that makes uh, simulacras. Uh, so, womankind. Yeah, is that a... Is that yeah, a, well, it's the, that yeah, the mother time? of all the robots, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because it just but, it was too, too, much, uh, too much similarity there for it to be an accident in any way, so... So it's just yeah. that the name itself is sort of... Oh, I think Pris Frauenzimmer is Dick's, like, that's his uh, surrogate mother character that he likes to drop yeah, into stories. Yeah. And it would be, it's kind of perfect, right? Because Chris has this sort of like castrating, naggy yeah. energy, yeah. right? And then to marry that with all of womankind. Like, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, I think it's sort of dick in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a mixed metaphor. <laughs> right? All the negative and the positive that he has for giving women power and taking it away at the same time. Now, we, we have Phil's response-ish to Ted White. I believe that quote from Ted White was long after Phil had passed that um, that, that quote was obtained uh, once the kind of 
once Phil's side of it got published, I believe in Paul Williams book. Um, but I'm not entirely certain where his, this take originally first came from, but before we do that, we need to talk about the fact that one of the things he's talking about, Phil's talking about here is that there was a animatronic Abraham Lincoln that was built in one of the Disney rides. Well, actually it was built for the world's fair. Oh, was it? Uh, in 64. And uh, then it moved to Disneyland in, in uh, 65. I have pictures of it if you want to see it. Sure. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great, uh, it was a great place to go in the middle of summer when you're at Disneyland and you needed to cool off because it, it was inside air conditioned. You just sit there and watch Lincoln yak away. Um, yeah. Well, the funny thing about it is too, is that th this gave Phil like a kind of like, Hey, I, you know, like, I, I thought of this I long mean, before. Either that. they, either they took it from him as an idea which is unlikely because he didn't publish the thing until 69 where he was just, I mean, had great foresight in seeing this, you know. No, he product. saw a, a, an animatronic Lincoln at Disneyland and he was like, oh, I'm going to write well, a book but that wasn't, He wrote this prior to that existing. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's the case. You, uh, he added Lincoln to it after? No. Yeah, in, that's possible. In Sutton, right? In Sutton on 108, but the animatronic wasn't built until 64. Uh, let's uh, see here. Because Anne says that they went to Disneyland and saw it together, I believe. Well, I'm Disney. sure they did. I don't doubt that, but well, the time frame. Well, you're looking for that, uh, Dave. Yeah. Anthony, do you want to read the uh, Phil quote there? Sure. I wrote that novel before Disney even proposed to build the Lincoln Simulacrum. I couldn't sell it for years and years and years and years. I wrote it while I was trying to fuse my mainstream stuff with my science fiction stuff. So it's not quite science fiction in the usual sense of the word. Finally, Ted White, who knew of the existence of the manuscript, asked for it so he could publish it in a magazine. Ted added a final chapter to it because, as is well known, writers are incapable of writing their own books. If it wasn't for kindly editors who are your best friends who will help you out by adding another chapter or removing one here or there or turning one inside out or changing all the names or whatever, you'd never have gotten off the ground. All right, man, just relax. <laughs> Naturally, I was very indebted to Ted White, and I let him know. The way I let him know was that when Wolheim published the book, I told Wolheim to remove the final chapters. So one day I ran into Ted White, and he said, do you know what they did to our book? I says, I know exactly what they did to our book, Ted, they took the hour out of our book. Whoa, dude, you're so salty right now. Yeah, so um, we'll get back into more uh, quote there. But yeah, so he was definitely um, pissed about it, <laughs> which is funny because he had the opportunity to do something about it. So this is like one of those classic, like, Phil Dick mood things. Yeah, right. <laughs> Are you telling me Dick was moody and, and very back and forth? Yeah, hmm. my yeah, my suspicion is when the Ted White thing came in, he was doing other things. He had something else going on, and he couldn't be bothered, and didn't really think that much of it. And then when he saw the ending later, then he was like pissed off because you know maybe he didn't care then, but now he cared once it was published, or I don't know. I mean, because the thing is, when that letter came through, he may not. It had been years. He had written like 25, you know, game players of Titan and Pen Ultimate Truth and everything else in between. And he probably didn't even think much of it. Like, I can't even be bothered to look at it. And then it becomes a whole different thing when it's in print and people are reading it and talking about yeah, right? it. Right. Then he has to have an opinion. Yeah. And then when Wolheim circles around and wants it, then, you know, and. Do do I and I have a hard time believing that Ted White would refer to it as our book. No. Because he wrote three thousand words at the end. I just I cannot see Ted White being like, What you, Phil, our book. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an anecdote made up completely out of whole cloth, just like to be to be an asshole. If I if I've learned anything from studying the guy, he did it over and over and over again. But he's expressing and, like one vein of feelings that he felt sometimes and other times he'd feel other thought you know i'm sure on a different day he would have hugged ted white and say i can't believe they took out your ending ted right you totally know? <laughs> yeah there's like the, there's no but, linchpin there to holding the guy like to a center 
where he's, you know, operating from. He's just all over the map all the time. Right. And that's more or less what Tessa told me when I interviewed her in Colorado was that he is really known to over embellish those things based off his mood swings. When I talked to Cleo, she said that was part of being a beat, which they considered themselves in the 50s, was like you embellish a story, you target it to the audience, everything's a narrative, it's right. all performative. Like, you know, he, it's, it, it gets into that, especially with the mystical experiences of the 70s too, so. Um, so basically, so you get a chance to- life like, a, uh, like some kind of performance art piece. <laughs> Yeah, did, did you ever get a chance to talk to Ted White about about this personally, or no? no? Yeah, because I don't know Ted White, but I only know what I heard about him, and it was interesting to to me that he um, he and uh, Maltzberg, like he had literally just taken the amazing job off of um, Maltzberg's hands at that point. So interesting timing. All right, uh, so we have another. Uh, did you find the picture that you wanted to show us? Oh, well, I have the pictures of these, uh, the, the Lincoln simulacrum, but that's bonkers. Like, in Sutton, he makes it seem like in, in 61, they were in Disneyland looking at the simulacrum, but I'm seeing that I agree it's 64 that it opens. Yeah. yeah. That's super weird to me. But you just, uh, but you never know. Uh, you know, Disney always had coming soon or in the future. In this, yeah. in this space okay. will be. So it could have been one of those things where it's like, you know, they, wanna... they had the ideas. Uh, Walt Disney had the idea from the mid '50s to do this uh, moments or whatever it is with Mr. Lincoln, and uh, so it might have been one of those things where in the space will be great moments with Mr. Lincoln, a talking robot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, Anthony, we have, uh, I have seen the Lincoln simulacra. Can you read that? I have seen the Lincoln simulacrum down there. I cut out the notice in the newspaper that Disney planned to build the Lincoln simulacrum and pasted it up on the wall of my study. There it is. Yeah. I remember doing that because the novel had already been written. So he built it and I went to Disneyland and looked at the goddamn thing. <laughs> God damn thing. So it's still it's still kind of shady, you know, what what came first, the chicken or the egg there. So All right. Uh so the next quote is PKD on Wolheim, Anthony. Oh, I'll tell you another Wolheim story. He was late in paying me for we can build you. I was really broke. Matter of fact, I was starving to death. My wife and I were living in Southern California sharing one can of chunky chicken soup a day. That was all we could afford. So I wrote Wilhelm in the, <clears throat> this pietist letter. Dear Don, I must tell you that I have been forced to give up writing science fiction and am going to work at Disneyland as one of the janitors who sweeps things up. The reason is because you have not sent me the money due me on We Can Build You. And you know what his answer was? Why don't you come to New York and go on welfare? <laughs> he said that. <laughs> he said that. Talk about your heart of stone. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Probably because he knew that, that Dick was kind of full of shit there. It's like, yeah, I get it. You're, you're in dire straits. But come on, man. You're sharing one can of soup a day. I don't, I don't buy it. Uh, that may have been. They were really, really, were they really there yeah. in the early 70s. Well, but still, it doesn't mean he's going to believe it. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, yeah, Dick's hyperbolic is yeah. all get out, so, yeah. And, and look at Wilhelm's situation at this point. Yeah. He left Ace. Yeah. He's starting yeah. a new publisher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, and it says here in my notes that Daw was a year old and that the first Daw book was actually published that year, 1972 Science Fiction Collection, and the first novel, Spell the Witch World by Andre Norton, was only like two or three months old. So he wasn't really raking it in yet. And he was taking a big risk. Like brand And this is not a great novel to build your brand on. <laughs> it's not like he's going to be like, okay, now we got, we can build it. Yeah. We're really going to, he's like, we're going to rake it in, Phil. The checks are going to start flowing. You're going to have two cans of chunky chicken soup next month. Um, so yeah, and um, but so okay. So this is a. I think the specific thing of what was going on with Daw right there is is a big deal for 
for why like there was this kind of you know tension between them but you know the next novel to come out two years later was also daw with um with uh flow my tears so it's not like wolheim and look we remember from talking to betsy that um that uh phil was never one of wolheim's biggest sellers but it was somebody that he appreciated enough to come back to and i think he cared enough about phil's vision that even though he wasn't you know that his top seller he kept he kept publishing him right so one last uh quote um from pkd is about his vision of the new kind of science fiction that he was going to write anthony can you read us this quote my vision collapsed i was crushed i had made a miscalculation somewhere and i didn't know where the evaluation i had made of myself of the marketplace went poof i reverted to a more primitive concept of my writing the books that might have followed, Time Slip, that is the first in your family, were gone. So we know that he, after this, we got our Game Players of Titan, our Penultimate Truths, our Three Stigmatas. So, I mean, he went full back into, like, in, into pulp after this. Now, that being said, some oh, of... Hold on, would you consider Three Stigmata pulpy? Comparatively to what this, his vision of what he was doing, Yes. Although I think it's his masterpiece, and I do think it's his best book, I don't think he saw it as being a part. I think he saw it as a part. Of I know he he doesn't like any of the books of his that I personally love. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's achieving the the formula that he's working out, and we can build you, which is a which is a hybrid of I'd like to call it literary fiction. It's not mainstream fiction it's no. not just stories that take place in the pedestrian it's stories that are loaded like essentially Hemingway's iceberg theory stories that are loaded with subtext with right. deeper metaphors you know like it's re he's really joining that with science fiction so I think that's an important distinction to make I think his best example of that his best examples of that are Scanner Darkly and Man in the High Castle but definitely Man in the High Castle but as far as like that vision, and then I think there's, but to me, like even Martian time slip is a little pulpy. It's a little, you know, it's got a Martian colony and, right. you know, but in my opinion, he, I think some of his best work specifically, I think three stigmata is his masterpiece. And he's probably considered that just like a pulpy thing. He was knocking out. Penultimate Truth, we know he thought that that was a reworking of a bunch of different short stories, yeah. right? And I, th I think those are two different, completely different novels, though. I think, I think Three Stigmata, he was really firing on all cylinders, and frankly, he was also going nuts. Like, so there's, there's the personal insanity he was experiencing after an um, amphetamine-fueled writing binge, that it lasted right. essentially five years, you know, and and he's just completely done. He's just his brain was completely cooked. Um, and also, he was he he built that story off of a a pulpy short story. So in his vision, it started as pulp. So it's, uh, but so did Three Stigmata, right? Because that was built off the short story, The Days of Perky Pat, which yeah. is all about the kids playing the game. So he's right. he's, he's got his own vision of what his work is whether that's the true vision of what it is or not, it's really not up to him. Okay, but let's say, let, let go back earlier. I like the novel Time Out of Joint because I think that's another instance where he's trying to yes. join mainstream fiction and science fiction. Uh, he's, he's, like, he oversimplifies the fact that he was just trying to do that after Man in the High Castle or with Man in the High Castle. He was trying to do that forever, but... Um, the thing that I want to defend about We Can Build You is I think it's the first real stab at what he was going for, which is like, again, it's not mainstream fiction, but it's the kind of fiction that's taught in literature classes in college mm -hmm. and the kind of stuff that's taught in those literature classes. Illusion, mm -hmm. metaphor, you know, not, this is not plot, it's not interesting in plot. This is all like really highfalutin, for lack of yeah, a better yeah. word. And, and I really, I really threw me. The That's genuals of it are there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, that's all I have on the uh, the publishing history of it is basically that it had the DAW edition, 
Um, it was not, it didn't have as many additions along the way as some other Phil books until like the vintage and the Mariner editions made it. Um, oh, that's a cool edition that you got there, Larry, for the YouTubers. Yeah, it's the. Yeah, I just had the, the Mariner. Off. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know which one. It I is. have that one, David, on my Kindle. So yeah, this I just had the the uh, the Mariner. Yeah, and this is the this is what we used to get in the 1990s. That that, <laughs> that cover is 90s as yeah. hell. Oh, well, that's it. my I flow my tears. I have the flow my tears of that one. But yeah. but I'm trying to keep all the Mariners together for having done this for a good fire. Yeah, yeah. and and I could see. See, there's mine. Uh, I can see that uh, Dave's is also equally all uh, marked oh, up. Yeah, I'm all marked up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, which is fun. All right, so uh, I think it's time, Larry. For, <clears throat> for the. What are you doing? What are you doing now? Uh, it, it may be time. Time for what? Orthogonal time. It's time for you to get on stage. <clears throat> Put your black metal corpse paint on, Larry. <clears throat> Story, story break up. Oh, whoa, David, <laughs> real with it. Think, okay. Think. <laughs> Larry, it's time for the story breakdown. Uh, I.e., David goes for a pee. Yeah, every I.e., everyone goes and takes a piss. While Larry, I kind of want to. While Larry takes. I kind of want to be here for this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one's going to be quick, I think. Oddly, this one's going to be fairly quick. Uh, so this is um, my book report on We Can Build You by Philip K. Dick, published in 1972. He's a, he wrote a book about, about these, um, these fellas that, that build a robot, a robot. So first of all, we start with a couple of guys. Basically, they're drinking buddies that have a business and these, these guys are Louis Rosen, and there's also Bob Bundy, who's their genius electronics guy. And there's um, Rock. Maury Rock. So uh, uh, oh. Louis Rosen and Bob Bundy and Maury Rock, they have this company, and it's kind of a, a not going well because they're selling these electronic accordions that are not very good. Uh, they're, they're definitely not as good as the mood organs made by a different company. So they decide they need to do something new. And so they decide to make a uh, like really lifelike robot. So they, uh, Rock says, uh, you know, on the side, we decided to make this robot and we're going to sell it to your pops so he can, uh, you know, build them in the factory. We'll change over from electronic accordions to uh to these uh new new simulacra they'll be great it'll be we'll reproduce the civil war it'll be great everyone will love it and our hero says i don't think that's a good idea and then they say no it's a great idea you'll love it shut up we're gonna do this thing so they decide to do the thing and the dad doesn't like it but he believes in the robot or the simulacra i'm fine i'll say simulacra here and there uh, and he's like, oh, that's cool. You made this thing. And uh, what are you going to do with it? And they're like, well, we have this idea, and it's a really bad idea to reenact the Civil War in its entirety somehow. And then uh, they, they, the daughter of Maury Rock, who is named Pris, is, she begins, we meet her, and she seems like she's got a little Asperger's. Like she's sort of really focused on, on her own thing and doesn't really have a lot of time for other people. And this, I mean, basically, if you want, if you want a good old fashioned view of what Asperger's is, this is a good view of what Asperger's is when we first meet her and have our first interaction with her. Uh, but we find out as it goes along that she's uh, just mean, just mean. Not uh, she isn't she isn't ill, she's just kind of mean. And but our dude, uh, our dude Louis is like, oh, I hate her. I'm in love with her, and I hate her. 
and I'm in love with her and I hate her and I'm in love with her and oh, and I hate her. Well, I'm in love with her. Uh, so then this guy, this rich Sam Barrow guy, he comes in and he's like, hey, I'm going to buy your thing and do a thing with it and it'll be great and I'm smarmy as hell. And the guys are like, oh, that's a bad idea. We don't, we don't want to work with this guy. But we kind of have to because we agreed to. But we don't have to if we do this cool stuff. Let's, let's do this Abraham Lincoln thing and then Abraham Lincoln will solve all our problems. And so they're like, oh, Abraham Lincoln, solve all our problems. And uh, so he, he kind of does for a while, but then our boy loses his mind and goes off to Seattle to shoot some people, maybe get the girl that he loves that doesn't want to have anything to do with him. He's, he's going all cuckoo. And then Abraham Lincoln says, you got to get that girl. And so he goes and she puts a heel of a high heeled shoe into another robot's brain and then our dude loses it even more, thinks he's banging her while he's it actually in the room with his dad and his brother. And uh, then he, everyone's like, you, dude, you got to go get some help. So he tries to go get some help. Doesn't really work out the end. Well, it sounds stupid when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, you have to do, uh, in a book report, you can't do subtext. <laughs> <laughs> you got to just go with the text. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the major themes that are going on. Um, the, the, the major themes that I have, and I don't know if you guys think I missed something, but I have the um, uh, human versus machine, the pre-Do uh, Androids Dream stuff, which the, the, um, the roots of that, the organs to robots slash colonies. That's a big theme that I have there. Um, the uh, the burrows, borrows slash Rosen stuff. And then, um, of course, I just have um, a bunch of the scenes that I think are pretty funny um, pointed out. Uh, that, <laughs> well, um, none of that is important, David, first of all. I would add to that. <laughs> There's a it's ton a good, of autobiography in this book. I agree and that's with the big thing that we need to look at because that's one of the things that these highfalutin authors were doing, and that's what Dick is imagining he's going to marry to science fiction. Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, the, what I, I was really curious how much of this equates to his life in some way. Well, yeah, let's I'll, start there. Can I lay out some of it for you? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and Dick, his sec, his second or third wife, depending on how you're counting. Yeah, right. Um, was originally named Anne Rubenstein. And she was from a Jewish family, and the, the, the rocks are loosely based on them. But there's also a connection. There's the other one is that there's a connection to Frankenstein here, right? What is Frankenstein? Stone of Franks. Stein is, Frank, is stone. So what is Maury's chosen name for himself? Maury Rock. Right. Right. And then the, the key here is the Jewish tradition of the golem, which is the man-made man that always um, betrays or surprises its creator slash master. Okay? So that, that's part of it. But this is written a year after Anne Rubenstein Dick had an abortion. They were going to have a second child, and they couldn't afford it. And so if you think about how this would break Phil Dick, it's a, a kind of a return to the story of his tragic birth with his twin, but in this retelling, we're killing the child because you, Phil Dick, don't make enough money writing science fiction to pay for it. Interesting. Okay. So all of this anger and stuff. Free Roe v. Wade, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was an illicit abortion they went to Seattle for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, okay, I mean, I'm going to share my screen a couple, one more time here because this is super interesting. Um, so when I went to go visit Anne in Point Reyes, she showed me her bathroom. And in her bathroom is the mural, right, that she made <laughs> when she... So that's real. Okay. When, yeah, when they were married, right? So that's this awesome. is what they did. Awesome. And uh, unfortunately... <laughs> They had a, a, this uh, long after Phil Dick died. They had a maid who apparently fell through the wall that had the part of 
the mural that had the mermaid on <laughs> it. Where I rotted. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a whole bunch of autobiography here about Phil and Anne's relationship. And again, I think that that's what Dick thinks that people like Hemingway and Fitzgerald are doing, right? They're yeah. writing about their, they're fictionalizing their lives, the glamour, the hunting, the excitement, the, you know? So Dick is like, all right, how am I going to do that? This is sort of, this is the autobiographical jalopy he, he comes up with. Um, but but it, like, also, it also fits his, uh, his imperfect protagonist character, you know, the of course. A, sort of anti-hero, flawed individual making things worse instead of better. Like, so it's, so it's not just autobiographical, it's also got that element to it, unless he, that's how he viewed himself, which is possible as well, I guess. Well, you're rooting for that guy, for Rosen, until you're like, dude, just yeah. go yeah. for it. Yeah, whatever. Kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. Go to Paris. Do something. I'm so done with you. Just, just please <laughs> shut the fuck up. Yeah. He wears out his welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because uh, in the beginning, he's nice and he's clever. He's like doing a back and forth. Yeah, he's got his problems, but it feels like there's a chance he can get over it. Like he can get over all that negativity but it, it doesn't. It just deepens. It gets worse and worse. And um, so that was great. Dave, I don't mean to put you on the spot because if you don't have this, it's fine. <coughs> but um, are there any uh, sections or parts of uh, or or parts of the book that you think really emphasize the autobiographical moments? Um, well, the part that Larry talked about, where Chris takes the high heel of her shoe and puts it through the robot. Anne, in her memoir, says that that's literally like Dick fictionalizing the abortion. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but it's also interesting, the way that Dick describes Chris is also super autobiographical about the anxiety around people, the inability to swallow, the, the struggles with social anxiety and panic attacks. That matches Dick spot on. It's also Anne. As, as, as to the person that I met up there and, and got to know, it's also Phil Dick's mom. So he's, he really is doing what he thought great authors did, which is that sort of fictionalizing autobiography and, and metaphor, making it metaphorical. And, uh, right. Now, he didn't get it right the first time, but he's on the right track. That's what I like about this book. He's on the right track. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so here, here's the here's the thing: is do you think talking with Anne about this book and getting those kind of insights, do you think that that gives you a different attitude towards We Can Build You than somebody who's just reading it who yep. would never know these things? I mean, yeah. I, I would assume that it does. So it absolutely does, and I can't, and I, and it's part of the reason that I love the book, and I can't divorce it from that. But again. <laughs> I also love what this became. Like you couldn't get Vallis or Scanner Darkly or any of those books that in, that integrated his life as beautifully as they did without this clunky jalopy as a, as a kind of a test run, a dry run. There's a couple yeah. of things here. First of all, Anne in an interview and in, in something I saw said, uh, and I think she was speaking about this book in particular, said she, she was reading it and saying, Jesus, I can't believe this is how Phil views me. I think yeah, I was talking yeah. about. Uh, I think she was talking about um, clans of the Alphane Moon. Do you think? Um, that, that well, I think this one. Too. I think this one's. Yeah, I think this one's harsher than that one. It is, no, and, and it's more it's clearly, auto, and it's more clearly her. It's pretty harsh too. Yeah. Well, but this has the this has the mosaic. Like this yeah. is you. Here you are doing a mosaic, being an insane bitch to me. <laughs> like here, you want to read what I wrote today? Here it is. <laughs> right. And the other thing is, uh, I don't know who said this, David, you might remember who said this, but uh, there's a lot of Dick's books that just shouldn't have been published. Like a lot of authors have books that they don't publish because they're just not, they're not there. They didn't make it to that, that point where the author thinks they, they're good enough. But Phil had to publish everything so he could make money. And this is one of those that I feel like really – if he was if he was making a good living, he wouldn't have worried about getting this one published. He would See, have been. I want to disagree. Yeah. I want to. I, I think, knew Gil was going to disagree with that. I think this is really close to his vision. I think that this but is that, really. That's the thing. It's really close, but it's not there. It's well, not there. 
Uh, I think it's getting ahead of, ahead of the debate. We'll, we'll come back and debate <laughs> when we get to final thoughts. And All right. Uh, I'm actually in more, more in agreement for once, uh, not with Larry. I agree with Dave on this one. And I didn't even like the book that much. So. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so you well, can be wrong, too. It's fine. No, I listen, um, I, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. Like, I'm not sure that... David, I, we know you hated it because it didn't have a plot. We get it. <laughs> we know. Well, and, go ahead, dude. I'm just messing with you. And it's first person. And it's first person, which you, which you famously hate. Yeah, uh, but there are first-person novels that that really work for me, like Dolores Claiborne, for example, is like. Well, and that new Stephen King book—that's first person. Yeah, later was great first person, actually. Um, but um, I, first person, if done right, I can handle it. I just think most people cheat when they write first person, and it's like a found footage. Yeah, but he's not—he's not cheating in this one. I don't think. No, it's, he doesn't cheat much he in really it. Really, strictly sticks to his own the the. Uh, the narrator's uh, point of view. He never drips outside that. No, so listen, um, I... Even there's when a, he there's an analogy... Outside that a little. There's an analogy. My friend that does the Metallica podcast, uh, Speak and Destroy, he always talks about that Lou Reed record that they did, Lulu, where he says that he thinks that record would have been fine if it was something that came out long after Metallica had broken up as like this weird curiosity, like, oh yeah, did you hear that they made this weird record with Lou Reed? And I, We Can Build You to me is like the same kind of thing. It's like, to me, it's like, yeah. like th this is the kind of thing that we, I feel like should be published later, that we, that, that study, that's like additions that people like us read, but I don't- So you're calling it an oddity. Yes, but I don't really think that it fits with the full canon, and I, that's going to be the debate when we come back to it, because obviously uh, Dave feels differently than I do about it, but, um, but it's just my personal feeling that, that this book doesn't come close. Like, it's not Cosmic Puppets bad um, to me. It's an uh, entirely different kind of bad. Yes, yes. Yeah, but, I agree with that. Yeah, but... But Dave, you have to admit you've you straight up told me that you've that you don't have to admit shit. Yes, he has to because he has told me that eight <laughs> times he has recommended this book to people where they have been pissed off at him for recommending it. To him. That's right. So, that I will say one of the things this book I would be pissed off too. I mean, yeah. I say. this book it has is a serious number when you're talking about it's true. That. It's true. Let well, the man talk. I'm like a glutton for punishment that I'm, I'm continually <laughs> handing it out even after people don't like it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, I stand by my, my view. I, I just, he just didn't quite, he didn't stick the landing, you know, I get, I get that, but. Uh, I listen to Smash Mouth on purpose sometimes, so I understand what it's like to. You should, you should admit that, but yeah, I, I, I think that, that's part of this though, like, I have bad taste. Like, I like this. This is what, the, one of my favorite scenes in this. Is I can't just sit down on the side of the road and watch there's a spaceship landing or taking off. I can't remember what it is. Landing. That, I, I was calling it pastoral science fiction. This oh, no. idea of like slow pace, no plot, like rolling characters. That to me is where I want to be. And that, that tells me that I either have bad taste or I'm not ambitious, I'm not good enough to pull off what I'm striving to see or, or get, you know? No, right. right. So, I, don't I, don't, I, don't, I think, I I think there's there a difference a between having, I don't think there's a, that it's bad taste. I, I think it's just that you, you're look, you look for something different in what you're reading or watching or what you're seeing out. Like, I'm the same way. I, I unapologetically, I, I love The Man Who Japed because it's so different and there's so many moments of it that are absolutely so strange. No one ever talks about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so sure. I I don't know I don't I don't know if it's bad taste as much as it's just you're looking for something different. At least that's how I see it for me, and how yeah, I, I make an excuse for right. watching some of the I will, shit I, will, I watch or read. I will definitely disagree with you on on specifics of the book, but I'm never going to disagree with your your uh, right to to like it. Right? <laughs> That's ridiculous. You have that right. Right. But we will disagree yeah. with David thinking Prometheus is a good movie. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a piece of shit, but... <laughs> it is. It's fucking garbage. 
will have that. But you, I mean, come on, some shits are amazing. Like you're just like, wow, look at that shit. That's yeah. fantastic. I mean, you're gonna flush it, but then you have to take but a it moment. Felt great to, going down, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well and, and sometimes, sometimes I just appreciate like what a writer or a filmmaker is trying to do more than how they execute yeah. it. So if I can sit down and go, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. And I don't know if it totally works, but I really appreciate the new angle, the new attempt. Because I, other than that, I, it's like me sitting around having to watch fucking Tenet again. <laughs> I don't want to watch this action bullshit pseudo-intellectual garbage. Sorry, <laughs> it's my Tenet rant. Really? When I'm talking to my students I love that movie, but... about their writing. I'm often saying, like, come on, put yourself on the page. There's nothing of you here. You know, and so the fact that I feel like this is one of the first Dick novels where he's really, he's really on the page in all of his like schlubbiness, you know, he's not, it's not like a, a self aggrandizing self portrait. But don't you he's feel he now. revels in that a little too much? Yeah. I mean, he revels in that, yeah. in that imperfectness a little too much, you know, the. Yeah, probably. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Rolling in it. He's just rolling in it. And as a reader, you want some redemption for the character. It just, yeah, but do those characters get any redemption? Do that, does that personality type ever wake up and smell the coffee, so to speak? But um, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily reading sci-fi for full-on realism, too. So, wow. you know, there's a balance. There's a balance in there, I think. I think that's life, though. Like, if you're approaching, like, not everybody gets a redemption story. Not everybody gets a, a, an arc that makes no, them I love look lots good. of bad sex You know. Stories. And, I'm a and huge I, Bukowski fan. I mean, come on. Those are all sad sack stories. All right, so let's talk about the human versus machine theme. Um, I don't know. Is there a human versus machine theme in this? I don't know if I really feel that way, considering some of the other books we've read of his, where it comes across, and I was actually going to ask Dave this, do you think that Dick is afraid of AI in technology? Well, no, but he's... He's interested in the way that conceptually it mirrors human thinking. Like that we're all programmed machines, we're all reflex machines. And so his, in, this, in this novel, the, eight, the humans are acting like robots. They're the ones trying to figure out what, what is the utility of this consciousness that we created? How can we monetize it fully to the maximum? And it's the and it's the robots who are like, well, let's think about this philosophically, heuristically, algorithm. You know what I mean? So yeah. if there is a, a a critique, it's inverted to what we think of it as. Yeah, the Stanton and the Lincoln seem to have it have their their shit together. Right? Yeah, they know what's going on. They're they're fine with being out of their own time. They they don't freak out because they're they they're, take it really well. Yeah. yeah, but see, don't freak out that they're robots. They're like, all right, all right, I can understand that. Okay, but, it's yeah. not, but it's not just robots we're talking about when we're talking about the human versus machine here. Um, let's talk about the obsolete <laughs> electronic organs, which, you know, we always have the Philip K. Dick protagonists working some ridiculous tire <laughs> regrooving job or whatever. <laughs> so, like... Here, the, the electronic organ being obsolete is a major and important factor of the early parts of the novel because, um, you know, like, um, you know, when uh, Mari, Mari says early on on page four, uh, time has passed us by, our electronic organ is obsolete. And then, you know, they talk about the Hammerstein mood organ, which, of course, the mood organ is, is, is something that becomes an actual physical device that we see a lot of in To Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, it's the first time we're kind of mining, or we're having, like, you can tell he's, he has little bits of these ideas, but he kind of drops them. And kind well, of, he's, he's also mentioning, in relation to the mood organ, Penfield, who is Wilder Penfield, the yeah. pioneering neurosurgeon who also happened just coincidentally be my grand uncle, a oh, great grand uncle. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of my family went to watch him do procedures where he operated on brain tumors and stuff. And mm -hmm. he's a legend. So Dick is super interested in that, but that's scary. Like the idea that you could be programmed, the idea that, you know, an organ could make you feel a particular thing. Those aren't like utopian dreams of technology for Dick. Those are, dystopian notions of control and manipulation. 
Yeah, and, and one of the one of my favorite lines early in the book is, like most people, I dabbled on the keys of the Hammerstein mood organ. You know, like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Well, you know, they, and they talk about, like, getting kind of high, right? And, like, like, laying on the floor and playing the footstops and everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, also, on page five, he... Uh, it gets a little, it, there's hints of a little bit more pulpy science fiction where uh, Bob Bundy, for all of electronic genius, had no experience with organs. He had designed uh, simulacra circuits for the government. Simulacra are synthetic humans, which are always thought of as robots. They are used for lunar exploration, sent up from time to time from the Cape. And this is one of those times where he offhandedly kind of mentions like these more pulpier elements, including the time where he drops an idea for a novel that I much rather would have would have much rather read when he starts talking about uh, later on about the um, the colonies. But we'll we'll get to that later. But, but uh, no, what what about them? What about the oh, colonies? Yeah. Well, like this whole idea, like um, that they're gonna um, the next door neighbors thing. Yeah, Hold yeah. On, let me let me get to yeah the page. It's on page one thirteen. He says, uh, you know, so Barrows has this idea that he's going to send up these simulacra to the moon to, because, like, people aren't wanting to go to the moon. Like, imagine that. Like, people don't want to go live in this lifeless place that we're not biologically evolved to live on. And so he wants to send up these robots to, like, be a, kind of the look at the Joneses and look at the, you know... And the quote is, as more and more people get hooked, I said, you could quietly begin to pull the simulacra back, the Edwards family and the Jones family and the rest. They'd sell their homes and move on until finally subdivisions, your track homes would be populated by authentic people. And no one would ever know. Um, I love the idea of that novel. <laughs> right? he doesn't, but doesn't he use that in one of the other novels? I, I feel like there's a, a time... Uh, Maybe it's the the one with the old man that has his whole town when he's a kid. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's that that I'm thinking of. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Martian time. No, that's uh, um, wait, uh, now wait for last year, I think. Now wait for last year, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. yeah Can we just talk yeah, about yeah. the connection that Dick is making between robotics and the Civil War? Yeah, I, yeah I, I didn't really get that. So. Well, it happens again in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, where you find out that when you go to Mars, they supply you with a perfect replica of a southern plantation populated by robots, like robots. Yeah, that's plants. also where, where he does that same thing. Yeah, That was yeah. the enemy takeover, wasn't it? Um, it may be in both, but I know that it's also in uh, which everyone I was just mentioning. Oh, we, we we're like trying to figure out where he did did all these ideas before. And it's kind of like right. <laughs> uh, so what? It's, what also, it, it's not just that he did them before; he did them. Some of them he did here first, and then put them in. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So. But how about this connection between robotics and slavery? The not idea of owning a person, the idea of commodifying consciousness. All, in 1962, that's pretty radical, you know. That's a fairly um, leftist, a subversive leftist political message inserted into science fiction. And again, that's what Dick imagines highfalutin authors are doing. Exactly. That's why I like that term, because that's what Dick would have called them. <laughs> but see, that's, these are all things that are heavy early in the novel that just get dropped and left behind, which is one of my problems with, with a lot of Phil's stuff is that when he just like forgets about like the stuff that's working early. Yeah, on. he just leaves certain plot lines in the past and characters yeah. in the past. And yeah, there's some funny moments too when when with involving the um, like how they test, you know, oh, all, yeah. the, all the scenes with the testing that like, and I love on page all those weird tests. <laughs> yeah, I love that like on page eleven when they're like, well, when he orders pizza, then we'll know. Yeah, like if the simulacra is able to order a pizza. <laughs> well, that's the Turing test, right? Will yeah, right. the waitress be able to figure out whether this is a robot or not? That's what I said when I was reading it. Yeah. I was like, this, this thing would definitely pass the Turing test. That's, a, that's no problem for it. Yeah, well, and all the tests for, for sanity, the Benjamin Proverbs test and everything, which apparently I was looking up, 
was a way that you really? would assess the level of schizophrenia in a patient is to say something like a gathering stone, a rolling stone gathers no moss. What do you make of that? Yeah. And yeah. like a schizophrenic person will have difficulty meeting, understanding that if you keep moving, you never accumulate anything. Well, see, I always, I always took it the way he got it wrong. <laughs> like a rolling stone gathers no moss means like you're, you're not stagnating. That's yeah. how I always, I, I yeah. always looked at that yeah. proverb. But it's really, it means you want to get uh, some kind of root system going. You want some kind of, to build something. And but it, it strikes me that it's that very subject, like the idea that you would test subjectivity is part of Dick's critique right. of psychology, right? That, okay, yeah, if you think the Rolling Stone gathers no moss means X, Y, or Z, you're crazy. But yeah. if you think that this crazy oblique <laughs> metaphor to a rock with, with moths on it means the other thing, well, then you're fine. You know, like that's part of this whole thing. That critique is really strong uh, and, and powerful. This is, what I, this is what I wrote about all his stuff in this, about uh, psychology. PKD's uh, pedantic pontifications on the subject of psychology read like Grandpa Simpson's senile rant about wearing a weasel in his pants. That's, that's how I saw that. Okay. Well, continuing on the human versus machine, and um, there, there's an interesting thing on page 13 where he talks about um, radiation mutants and how they would grade, right? And so he's basically talking about them as being special person births and talking about, um, and that was interesting to me because he's talking about radiation and H-bomb testing and all that stuff. And what was interesting to me with that is I just finished reading um, The Best of Judith Merrill. And, of course, her classic short story, um, Only a Mother, which a uh, friend of the show, Lisa Yazik, teaches in her classes, um, was one of the first stories in 1948 to write about science, use science fiction story about radiation and fallout babies and stuff like that. So um, it was interesting to me because when I first read this was before I kind of reread that Merrill story. And I thought, I thought it was really far think or forward thinking that he was thinking about these issues. But of course they had, those issues had been around for a long time, but I do think it was, it's interesting that he's talking about them as, is like, well, are the simulacra going to be like special needs people? Are they going to have to, are they going to be, somewhat human but not able to function fully in society and i thought that was an interesting who what was the job that pris originally applied for before she got the idea to go to barrows she was going to be the person that decided who got to emigrate out yeah. of America and who was too messed up from radiation to stay in other words she'd serve as a nazi to yeah, choose right. who were the ubermensch and who weren't you know so the the connections here are are pretty clear. Yeah, also a thing that, that comes up in uh, the Android stream of electric sheep is the emigration yeah. like policies and all that, so. Yeah. yeah, I think this was really a dry run at that novel and that the better, he came up with a better idea, which is the plot, oh, you've got to retire all of these robots in a certain amount of time, and then he goes, okay, where do I get my characters and my setup, boom, cannibalizes that, like, just as an artist looking at another artist's work, kind of like behind the scenes, looking at their hard drive and what they're cutting and pasting from and stuff. Yeah, right. It's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Also, no. and also the emulation part, em emulating other authors. Yeah. Like uh, Stephen King talks about that in the beginning of his career. He would just write stories based on someone else's work. Like, I'm going to write a story in this person's style and see what he could do with that. And I guess that's, well, that's all about maybe, finding your voice. That's yeah, how you find doing your voice. The same thing kind of here is like, okay, I'm taking elements from Hemingway and, and here and whoever he's, he's doing, but that's a, uh, but, but that shows you what's cool here is that with this experiment of we can build you, he's trying to find his voice and trying to do something original. Yeah. And then when he comes up with something that's truly better is when he just accepts the pulp. Attitude. Part of it. And yeah. and reshifts all the ideas and then makes do androids dream of electric. Yeah, sheep. but then yeah, he integrates the two ideas much much better. Yeah, uh, it, you know, so I will agree with you, David, that this that I 
I liked reading this as a dickhead yeah. looking at what he did. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Did this not, is not what you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did not enjoy this as a story. No. It's a but deep I enjoyed cut. this yeah. a as a as a as a dickhead. Well, oh, you yeah. know what it you know what it reminded me of more than any anything else outside of, of other dick stuff is uh The Killer Inside Me uh by uh the Jim Thompson Jim book? Thompson book. Yeah. Because this character seems to have that like psychosis in, in the killer inside me is a, this, he's basically a serial killer, but he doesn't talk about things. It's, and it's first person narrative. He just talks about things like, why are these people making me kill them? Why can't they just do it themselves? And uh, this sort of has that same, same appeal is that this guy's like losing his shit. And, but it's, it seems natural to him. He's like, well, of course I got to kill that guy and grab the girl and take her back to Boise. Duh. Like, how, how come no one else is seeing this? All right. Yeah. So, um, all good points. Um, page 49 and 50 is where we first see him, like, say, maybe I'm the simulacra, or, you know, he considers those ideas. And I Well, he is in the sense that he cannot escape the programmatic attraction to this person that both attracts him and repels him. So he's absolutely a robot insofar as, if you look at it from Dick's autobiographical perspective, he's got an Oedipal complex that he can't resolve. Right. Yeah. Um, on page uh, 65 is where um, he, I like the line, it's all a self-deception. We can't really restore life to something that's dead. And um, because a lot of people are like, whoa, it's like you totally brought Abe Lincoln back to life, man. Mm -hmm. And like, um, and basically what he's saying here is like, no, it's just, it's just a machine. It's just like a toy basically. And that we can't really re bring back life, but that's the human versus machine there. But that's also his view of Nazism, right? Yeah. That in, in some ways Nazism is this programmatic loss of humanity itself and this um, calculation and so forth so yeah the barrow the barrow and lincoln debate about what makes a man i mean yeah. it's right there's page 109 that was the next thing i was going to bring up um and that's where uh um Barrow, whatever his name is Barrow. yeah lincoln has the whole debate with him and i think that's you know on page 109 to page 110 is one of the most important parts of the book as far as theme goes with that, where they have that debate and um, Lincoln just straight up says, would you tell me, sir, what a man is, you know? And then, uh, and basically Burroughs is kind of like, eh, you know, I can't, I can't really tell you. <laughs> uh, but, um, and then Simulacra says, but a machine can talk. And he says, sure, radios, phonographs, tape recorders, telephones, they all yak away like mad. Um, if you were to ask Elon Musk, what, what defines a man? <laughs> Think about what his answer would be, like how he would utterly fail to answer that question. His ability to go to space. Yeah, yeah. Man, is his accomplishments, man. Right, so I've seen like Saturday Night Live. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Man is achieving new frontiers. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, kudos to the first person on this panel to tweet at Elon Musk. Ask him, <laughs> what exactly is a human? Um, and uh, we'll see what his response so, uh, is. So I, I have a question. Like, uh, so the, our, our guy, whatever his name is, uh, Rosin Louis, he, uh, or Rosen, he can't make decisions. Which is German for roses. He, he can't make any kind of decision because he, he immediately says it's a bad idea. No matter what decision he makes, he's like, oh, wait, don't, don't listen to me. That was a terrible idea, no matter what it is, till it comes to bad ideas. And then when he has bad ideas, he's like, oh, yeah, these are the good ideas. Like that little voice he talks about in the back of his head saying, of course, I've got this guy on the ropes. I'm Look at it, he's totally gonna do what I say. And of course that's totally false. So what where does that come from? Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's Hamlet in a nutshell. That's every time he's, you know, oh I'll kill him while he's praying. No, 
Then it'll go straight to heaven, gosh right, darn it. Right. All right, I like that. I like that, eh? Yeah. Oh, you know, it'll be a great idea. I'll have a play, and in the play, I'll accuse my uncle of killing this. It'll be great. Right. <laughs> so, oh. so, okay, that's all I've well, got. It really on. is pulling. I mean, uh, whether or not that's, that's a fact, or, or, I don't know. Is that a fact, or is that just supposition? Yeah. He's it, into Hamlet. It gets super into Hamlet for a while in the exegesis. <laughs> But like he's, yeah, he's definitely taking stuff, like you said, from all these, all these uh, sources. So it makes sense that he would have that in his character, that, uh, that sort of dichotomy of good decision, bad decision, indecisiveness. The other influence I want to mention is this novel that nobody talks about in relation to Phil Dick. It's a novel that came out in the 1950s called The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. They made a movie out of it. Yeah, I've um, heard of them. It's by Sloan Wilson, and it's what Cleo, Minnie, Dick's uh, second wife, said was the, Dick, the book that Dick was trying to emulate in terms of mainstream fiction. If you pick up that book and read the first two paragraphs, you'll think you're reading a Philip K. Dick book. The first paragraph describes the narrator's feet as they're standing on a floor that's disintegrating from water damage and they're washing the plates and it's so dicky and it's unbelievable. So it's not always the highfalutin guys. In part, it's this like, you know, like there was all of this debate about where did Dick get his multi-foci plot device where he's going from different characters and he gave some bullshit argument where he said he learned it from the University of Tokyo's French department, which nobody can figure out. <laughs> Somebody pointed out that was the stre that was the novel style for Peyton Place, which would have been you know a really big selling novel that Dick would have read at around that time. You know, so really, really? <laughs> another one of these things I'm always trying to prove is that Dick watched um, um, It's a Wonderful Life. I'm convinced that that was like a formative influence for Phil Dick, and the only evidence we have is in the novel where he mentions something about when somebody does something, a government agent kills himself or something. It's yeah, yeah, the yeah. inverse of when you say something, an angel gets its wings. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, I mean, It's a Wonderful Life is just one of those things that kind of like everybody's seen. And even by osmosis, if you haven't seen It's, it's, a, it's a Wonderful Life, it's influenced so many things that, you know, I, 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 yeah, that's kind of. Watch the scene where he goes to Pottersville. Pottersville is the alternate reality in all of these dick things where con con commodity and consumption is taken over and people have given themselves over to their, you know, base Other instincts and so yeah. forth. So, um, Dave, I wonder um, if we could kind of sum up, I know we've talked a little bit already about this, but the, the pre do Android dream of electric sheep things, is there anything that we've missed that obviously Rosen and Pris and, and, um, you know, organs, organs and, yeah. and, 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 but. It, and the I, Civil War stuff, bringing up uh, simulacrum robots in relation to the Civil War. Yeah. That's uh, another one. Right. Weak, but there. Yeah. And so, but is it fair to say this is a prequel to Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, or is it more fair to say it's just a cannibalization? Like a demo tape, a rough draft. Uh, alternate cut something. Yeah, I think you have to go to like musical terms. You know what? What yeah, is right. it? In, it doesn't in, take no. place in the same universe. It's not the same Rosen Tyrell Corporation. Well, no, I, I I'm more inclined to believe that it is that it could be the prequel that sets up the Rosen Corporation to become Eldon Rosen and the manufacturer. I I'm I'm willing to believe that. Like Dick could have been said of said, well, I don't want to take those characters. I'll just go three generations ahead in the family or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's a really cool way to look at it. Honestly, I yeah. like that. It, but again, it's not something that would be accessible to a, a, a novice, a novice Dick reader. Uh, so it really is a, a novel that rewards people who know more about the book. And I would recommend reading Sutton's biography before reading the novel, just because you'll get so much more out of the novel with that information. 
Right. right. This is kind of like getting a B-Sides album and listening to those and how they kind of work in with the bigger album or just, a, like you said, a demo tape and then hearing how those songs progressed and became more fully fleshed out. But I really like looking at this as a prequel to Do Android's Dream. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those demo tapes, like, even though they're raw and they have flaws, there's some magic to them that the more polished yeah. version can't re- recreate. So. Again, part of what I, lo- I come back to this with is the unflinching self-reflection of Phil Dick. <laughs> He's not making himself out to be the hero in the story. He's, it's a real, um, like, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of like therapy. When you really go and you're forced to confront, like, oh, shit, it's not everybody else's fault. You know, I bear some responsibility in the way that this is all played out. That's a, There's a catharsis uh, in that. Well, and, resp- and adulthood and responsibility yeah. and, you know, maturity. Actually, I felt like uh, one of the things I liked about this book, and, and I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but uh, I, I'm reading this character, and at the beginning I was like, I'm, I have nothing in common with this character. He's a total jackass. I hate him. Like, I don't, I don't agree with any of his decisions. But then the more I looked at it and the more I, I'm reading along, I'm like, I've definitely made decisions like these. I've definitely made decisions and said, oh, shit, you know, this is going to be the wrong thing, you know, like, and totally had, went the wrong way, took the wrong path, and just because of what was going on in my head. And I, I by the end, I was like, I, under, I get this. I get this character. I understand, like, at least partially that it's me in there, you know, and that's, I don't know if anybody else felt that same kind of connection to to the character, to Louis, that uh, you can find pieces of yourself in there. Yeah, well, he was utterly failed by the mental health industry of, the, of that world. Like, they didn't, they didn't help, essentially. Didn't help <laughs> well, it's interesting. It's a very much like um, cognitive behavioral therapy, where the, it involves, like, exposure to, if you're scared of spiders, they yeah. bring a spider into the room, and then they, you know, and, like, if, if you're into depth psychology, like Phil Dick is, that everything is not just like a manifestation of a, of a simple relationship, but is a, is a symptom of a deeper perturbation or warping or something. Um, uh, there's a lot more there to yeah, yeah, grab it's onto. True. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's funny because, you know, if you look at the Elon Musk tweet, what's really funny to think about it is the rest of us might not be living a Philip K. Dick joke, but he pretty much is. Yeah. Like he, Elon Musk is living, is, is Sam Barrows. Like, yeah, he's surrounded by yes men. He's puffed up perpetually by a media that wants to, and yeah, that's, it, that's absolutely true. And then, so and there's two things that made me think of that too. On page 25, he managed to get the United States government to permit uh, private speculation and land on other planets. Yeah. And <laughs> had single-handedly opened the way so for subdividers on Luna, Mars, and Venus. His name would go down in history forever. Like, I mean, how much is Elon Musk, like, actually doing work for the government, putting stuff in space? But so what's really funny in reflection of that tweet that it came out right before we recorded this episode is that... Um, if anyone's living a Philip K. Dick joke right now, it, it, uh, there's a good argument for <laughs> Elon Musk. Right. Um, uh, one thing about the, ro- the, um, the robots to colonies thing is um, Bob Bundy's role as being like the, the, the kind of engineer behind it. And this idea that, that like, oh, they're talk- on page 149, they're talking about their babysitters. And how, like, hey, if we don't have Bob Bundy, like, we're, we're fucked, you know? And so it's weird that Bob Bundy, who's just kind of, like, not a main character, has this kind of important role. Hardly, in the- hardly a character at all. Yeah. But, he, and he, but he's also clearly on the spectrum. There's something about They talk about he's unshaven and he moves from one task to another and all, all of these. It's, it's the pairing of him and Chris and their sort of neurodiversity that allows the creation of the Lincoln. That's really key because I think that, see, the super weird thing to me is these guys who read Philip K. Dick and then go, you know what we ought to do is make a robot that looks like Phil Dick. That would be a great idea. He loved robots. 
<laughs> not he was terrified of robots, right? Yeah. Um, well, and okay, so then in the back half of the book, the last 20 pages or so, and the things that, once we get to the point where the whole book becomes about, like, um, in, in an autobiographical sense, we have the character, like, moping around because they're in that part of the Divorcipedia um, history timeline. So you have this character that's obviously based on Phil and Anne, right, where he's going through this divorce and basically at the end he's like, am I crazy? Am I going crazy? And, and it's funny because you look at my copy of this book and the first, like, hundred pages, just like every other Philip K. Dick book, I'm highlighting, I'm highlighting, I'm highlighting. And then the last part of the book, like, my highlighter, like, I hardly ever took the cap off. Because I was just like, I don't give a f shit about any of this stuff that's happening. And I understand, before you even say it, Dave, <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Yes, it's autobiographical. And yes, you could get into it for that sense. But at the same time... Those are things that I don't find particularly interesting about Phil in the sense that just me personally, when the difference in how I come at this and how you come at this is I, I come to these stories like thinking about Phil the writer, not Phil the weirdo. I know. I know. Yeah. He would prefer that so much to the way <laughs> I look at it. Exactly. Like, he would be your friend and not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, just to kind of to jump piggyback on that, this that point – let me back it up. The book for me, and I said this earlier, it stops with Louis imagining himself with Pris on the bed while his dad and his brother are watching. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is strange enough in its own right. Fine, whatever. Um, after that, it becomes, for me, it doesn't work because it becomes a completely different book about this person who is essentially in a mental institution going through these hallucinatory fugue states to understand their relationships with, with this person better, which I wouldn't mind. I'd read a total, I'd totally read that book, but it's so, it's such a harsh left turn from everything that builds up to it that I, I just didn't know what to do. I was like, what the book's over. It ended. I think that it ending with them on the bed is perfect. That is a perfect kind of more artistic, surreal ending for me personally, because I'm, I love ambiguous stuff. Yeah, yeah. But the the reason all those pages don't work is because it feels like a completely different book. Here's an ending. I just came up with this. This is really good. Hit me with so, it. So, Louis in this in asylum, going over and over again, living his life with Chris, over and over. He can't stop. One day, they're like, you know, Mr. Rose and your lawyers are here to see you. He's like, I have lawyers. What's going on? I see what's going on. And he's been trapped in there, and here comes Lincoln and Stanton, and they're like, we're going to get you out, buddy. You're free. We've talked yes. to the judge. You were in here wrong. We're going to take you, and we're going to go out, and the three of us are going to start this new enterprise. And they walk out the door of the asylum, and that's the end. <laughs> Hell yeah. I could, I could go with that. I'm down for that. I, uh, Anthony, so I, already, I, don't think, I don't think it comes out of left field. Because I think every oh, I thing, disagree a hundred percent is leading to that that point where he has the breakdown from the beginning. You, you can yeah. see going towards some kind of full on psychosis. Yeah, I don't think it's left field. I just think it's not good. Yeah, I, I can no, agree. No, I disagree. I it's tonally it. off. It's tonally off. It, it has nothing to do with what came before. Yeah, no, it does. Other, other than Pris. Doesn't. Other than Pris. It becomes less about them developing the simulacrums. Oh, no, it, it has nothing to do with that. And then, and then it becomes to totally about his obsession with Pris. And it, it, that's but, not what the book was leading me to believe it was but about. But the book was never really about the simulacrum. Which is why I don't like yeah. it. That's, well, that's <laughs> a problem. Yeah. And that is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm not saying you're wrong, but uh, it is in there. But that, you are, unless, and, and, and more or less, you are saying I'm wrong. No, no, I'm not saying you're wrong because it is sort of, like you say, it's disjointed. But it's not out of nowhere. That's the only thing I'm saying is, is, is wrong with what you're saying. Because it is, it is leading up to that point. But Well, I think that comes not, into not, how you read the book. Not developing for that me, plot element is, is yeah. Because I'm more invested in what's going on with the simulacrums, yeah. personally. 
So he, so here's the thing. Like up to the point, I feel like their story is kind of done. Don't you? No. 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 Not like, at all. That Stan has his place. Lincoln has his place in the business. They're kind of done. I kind of love the idea, by the way, that Lincoln just kind of ends up like practicing law <laughs> in the modern world. And he's just like, you know, he's like this robotic Abraham Lincoln. And then like, I just had this idea of this guy getting arrested on like weed holding charges. And then they're like, oh, we assigned you a public. That is Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and he walks in with his top hat and he's like, hello, sir. <laughs> like, like. Uh, my court-appointed lawyer is a robotic Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> now that is a funny a short story. That's for sure. That yeah. is a story. Yeah, a story. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying it's funny. No, I, I um, look. I think that it's set up the things that there's things that work about it, but I just and look, I'm loving the discussion, and I, and I think that as a source of talking. Like I said, as, as a dickhead curiosity, as a thing that 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 informs us about Philip K. Dick, you might have a four star book. But as an actual novel, it ain't gonna be four stars. I'm sorry, it's not for me. But and I'm getting, I'm not gonna spoil it. But but my but my thing is is that I just I. I, I think as a novel on its own, if you don't know these things, if you haven't read the Sutton, because you're right, um, Dave, if you read the Sutton book, which I have, then then a lot of these things make more sense. But I know um, Larry and Anthony, they haven't read the Sutton book. So, um, you know, it's going to be different for a different experience. And in, in that sense... I don't know. Okay, so before we get into our overall thoughts, um, I just have a I gotta give you I gotta give you one thing I think is super cool. And then we were talking about where does the book set you up? What does it set you up for and where does it go? Yeah, sure. Okay, so on my probably sixth or seventh rereading of this novel, <laughs> I stumbled on this little thing that's in my edition on page four, right? This is when they're first meeting and they have this argument and it says, um, now, this enormous balance in favor of the spinet over the electronic organ in terms of sales led to an exchange between I and my partner, mm -hmm. Maury Rock. It was heated, too. Between I and my partner, right, is the flipping of subject and object. Yes. There's another, I know there's at least one other example of that happening in this book. I can't find it. It happens with one of the characters in um, the, the Galactic Pot Healer. When you meet oh, yeah. Molly, she, she flips that as part of her learning English. Hmm. So one of the things that Dick is into is these existential psychologists like, um, like Rollo May and Ludwig Binswanger, who had a patient named Ellen West, who had the exact same symptoms that are described as Chris, like anorexia, all this kind of tomb world stuff, that's all, all, all there. So Rollo May says, these existential psychologists say, that's the whole human dilemma, is between that we can view ourselves simultaneously as a subject and as an object, okay? Mm -hmm. And so like the subject is like, all right, I'm gonna take a bong hit right now, here I go. And the object is like, dude, it's 11.30 a.m. and you said you weren't gonna do bong hits until 4.20, right? And so that, gap, that space between what we do and how we view ourselves doing it is like the fundamental position of, of psychology. And I think that this novel like weaves out that, that notion, right? Like that, like you were saying, like he comes up with an idea and then he immediately goes, oh, that's not a good idea. So the subject, the actor has a motivation to do something. And then the, the, the object goes, oh, you don't want to do that. That's, you know, yeah, but then in other places he doesn't. So the, the fact that Dick is using like essentially a grammatical error to set up a, a fundamental like ideology about these characters that you're kind of ascribing to and you don't even know it hmm. is hardcore, really good, highfalutin writing. 
Right. You know, <laughs> so it's like the, it's like the stuff that these really high paid, really award winning authors that appear in the New Yorker, like Paul Oster and all those guys, like right. they would kill to be able to do stuff like that, you know, with that kind of economy. Right. So, yeah. To pull off that kind of maneuver, you know, in, in but he also used the term fart faces in this book. So, <laughs> um, but we'll get to that in a second. So here's one of my problems. Like, that's awesome. Uh, Dave, I, I I now officially want you around forever. Um, but <laughs> here's the thing. Um, this book is not as funny as a lot of Philip K. Dick books. And um, unfor and I've grown... So well, it has funny moments. Don't get me wrong. It has funny moments. But one of the things that I've grown accustomed to recently is of constantly trying to remind people that Philip K. Dick was hilarious and that there's funny moments throughout his books. And I, and like me, like highlighting the parts that are hilarious to me is something that I look forward to. And I only had three of those in this book. One of which brother is- brother has an upside down face. Come on. Nothing? Yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, the John Wilkes Booth thing was hilarious that in order to kill the Abraham Lincoln simulacra, they, they <laughs> made the John Wilkes Booth. And then they're like, yeah, it looks know. nothing like him. It's great. I yeah, thought that was great. And then great. they're like trying to test him because, well, he's an actor. See if he knows Shakespeare. <laughs> like, that, <laughs> that stuff was hilarious. Um, page 175, um, when he asked, uh, Rosen asks Bar Barrows, um, are you going to marry Pris? There was no answer. I'm going to shoot you, I said. And then he says, ah, for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going to get all these words wrong, but uh, Sam, I've got the, I've got a Japanese all made transistorized and supple off the uh, floating, <laughs> floating anti-personnel mine in my possession. That's how I was thinking of my uh, 38 Alex. pistol, and I'm going to release it in the C Seattle area. Do you know what that means? Uh, no, not exactly. <laughs> Does that have something to do with my brain? Yes, Sam, your brain. Mari and I recorded your brain patterns when you were at your office in Ontario. That was a mistake on your part to go there. The mine will seek you out and detonate, and once I release it, there's no holding it back. It's curtains for you. That was hilarious. That was one of my favorite parts. I, I think that whole scene is funny. That whole scene uh, is Like funny. I said, the part where he's in the back of his head going, you got him. You got him. He's so scared of you now. Right. Really funny. Then, well, he's just sounding like a damn wacko. <laughs> which continues on page 182, and that's where he says, um, you goofball drop dead if you think you're going to horn in. I know all about what you're up to, you fat-ass fart faces can't design your simulacra without me, can you? So uh, so you want to back me? Well, uh, well, go to hell. And if you try to come around here, I'll scream you're raping me or killing me, and I'll send the rest of you to jail for life. Um, <laughs> that part is hilarious. Um, and that's what, in, when, in, and Dave, you're talking about all these awesome, like, wow, this is really incredible literature he's achieving. And then he has... yeah. You fat ass fart faces and like, and so I kind of, <laughs> I appreciate that because I actually like the balance of that. And hey, my favorite line in the whole book is, uh, if anybody can help me, Abraham Lincoln can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you can get your girl back for you. And that's Abraham when, Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and that's when, pretty soon after that's when Lincoln's like, what does a hick like me know? Yeah. So he's like, you know, Abraham Lincoln's going to help me. And then Abraham Lincoln's like, have you met Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's the buddy cop movie I want now. So, yeah. right. um, so speaking of buddy cop movies, uh, I, I actually did a little research on Stanton and Lincoln's relationship. It was awesome. <laughs> oh, was they it? They had a great relationship. Like, uh, first of all, they had to go through the Civil War together. They basically ran the Civil War, those two men. You know, the, the generals, of course, did the actual planning of the war. But uh, as far as the, the political end, it was those two that made the war work. And they did it in an anti antagonistic, 
friendship style. Like uh, they had a great working relationship where Stan was not afraid to say that Lincoln was full of shit. Oh God. And Here, Lincoln, and Lincoln was Doris afraid, Goodwin's book or something. And Lincoln wasn't afraid to, uh, what are you going goodwill hunting on me here? Uh, so, and Lincoln wasn't afraid to say that Stanton had to do what Lincoln said. And it was a, so it was a super relationship. And I think Dick did a good job of getting that on the page because they, they do have that, that kind of relationship. Like Stanton says that, you know, oh, it looks like he hates Lincoln, right? And then Lincoln says, we can't do this without Stanton, make sure he's part of this. And that's exactly what happened during the Civil War. And Stanton was the one that didn't want him to go to the theater. He wanted more protection for Lincoln. Oh. You know, there was all that, all that connection is there. I thought it was really well done in the book. No, it's just that I was just making a joke is that uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, the presidential biographer, wrote that book that that everybody was supposed to read when Obama was president. That was oh, about, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it would explain why he was bringing in Republicans to his cabinet. That yeah, was yeah. The right. idea that it was going to be explained to us there. <laughs> oh, that was a good idea. Right, right. <laughs> and look how that turned out. Uh, yeah, well. But it's true that, uh, you know, Lincoln was a Republican and uh, Stanton was a Democrat, and they uh, really fought tooth and nail even before they, were, they had those jobs. Okay, so I, of course, have Ken Stanley Robinson quotes before we get into uh, um, our final thoughts. This retracking of the narrative made so complete by the use of the first person point of view leaves the reader very dissatisfied for we are forced to abandon a fully stated fictional problem for a private obsession that we witness but do not share. Uh, the continuation of the wait no, yeah, keep going. The continuation of the narrative leads in a new direction but in this case we never return to the original subject matter thus we can build you as the epit <clears throat> epitome of the broken backed novel in Dick's work. Wow. All right. Let's talk about that for a little bit. <laughs> so what, um, I'm not what, in disagreement with him. <laughs> yeah. So this is obviously from Ken Stanley Robinson's, um, graduate, yeah. um, or PhD paper on Philip K. Dick. And so he, he really didn't like the shifting of, or the loss of the original storyline. So it, that's, but that's because it was part of his doctoral thesis was that Dick's whole thing was multi-foci. So yeah. the, the, this oh, that, was, that, was that pattern would be something that Robinson might draw extra attention to. Mm -hmm. Like if you wanted to bolster your argument that what made the multi-foci novels good was to, was to pan the one that was. Oh yeah. So before we go to the last Ken Stanley Robinson quote, and then we have a Theodore Sturgeon quote, which um, on this book from 1973. Um, but it's interesting that he's that he seems to have a it, that Robinson's like, hey, this it's all about this personal obsession that we don't care about. Well, a lot of times we don't care about things in novels, and it's up to the author to make us care about it. Yeah, that's I, I mean that's sort of cop outy. I think. Yeah, I just yeah. I feel like. Okay, it didn't work for you, dude, but that doesn't mean that, that it doesn't work. And, and it, look, it didn't work for me either. I kind of actually agree with him on it. But at the same time, like, I don't, I'm not going to write off the novel just because, like, it's about an obsession that I don't have, like. Yeah, lots of novels are about obsessions. There's nothing wrong with that element to it. Take I don't, but I don't. I'll use. I think of, sorry, go ahead. I'll use, um, sorry, motorcycle. Um. <laughs> Uh, I'll use, for example, like Less Than Zero. I, I'm not a drug person. I'm straight edge. But I really enjoy that novel, and I enjoy the movie, too, even though, like, those are not obsessions I share. But right. it's, you Someone know, else's obsession is just as, can be just as exciting as your own. Okay, and the last Ken Stanley Robinson quote, uh, Anthony. All righty. In this reading, the loss of narrative control exhibited by Dick becomes an effective device. Whether this is deliberate is doubtful. It is more likely that, as with the earlier broken-backed expansions, Dick had moved on to new interests by the time he did the expanding, but is the best defense one can make for this strange and not inconsiderable volume. <laughs> Ooh! 
<laughs> yeah, I knew you were. Okay, gonna... So now I'm back to not agreeing with him because I, <laughs> I think it was very intentional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think in other cases, there have been times where, like, for example, Ubik is an example of a time where he started off with one interest and by the end he had a completely different interest and it worked. Yeah. But, but it, I still like, there's still a part of me that wants that corporate spy. Oh wait, I got it with inception. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, but part of me still wants that first novel that Dick was starting to write. And in this case, I want the novel of the, the, the Joneses robots on the moon and the people who are like, I moved here to live with these awesome robots and they keep moving out of town. You know, now it's just a bunch of humans on the moon. What happened to our robots? Um, okay, Anthony. So we have a quote from Theodore Sturgeon from the 1973 issue, January 1973 issue of Galaxy Magazine. And his last name is also a fish. True. <clears throat> and he lived in Eugene, Oregon. Anthony. Uh, all and right, he so was so. an enthusiastic nudist. <laughs> Wait, is that true? Yes. He often invited his guests to be naked while what he was naked. unenthusiastic nudist. Yeah, well, that's not, yeah, you don't want to mess with him. <laughs> um, he also... Uh, I love this information. Thank you. <laughs> he also figured out how Vulcans would reproduce on Star Trek. He was the one who made that up, so... Um, all right, so Teddy Sturgeon said... We can build you proofs for all time that one, Philip K. Dick is overwhelmingly competent and capable and might, probably will, produce a major novel, and that two, this isn't it. <laughs> I base the first half on his handling of his characters, who are consistently and warmly recognizable, even in their stubborn irrationalities, on the boldness and provocation of his themes and his side remarks, on the richness of his auctorial background. Was that supposed to say? And the sparkles of laughter finger flicked all over his work. I based the second on his willingness to pursue some collateral and fascinating line at the expense and even the abandonment of his central theme, which was, or so in the book he told me, the manufacture of ex exact simulacra of any human being in the impact of this development on humanity. The pursuit in and out of the fringes of insanity of an obsessive love affair had me laughing and crying, but Dick and I were both conned. Weak-willed as Dieter gobbling hot fudge sundaes into this delight instead of going about our business. All right. I, I think that's a fair assessment of the, of the book, that first sentence part, where it's a totally competent, great writer, and this is not the great book that he's <laughs> This is not it, yeah. Well, I just recently read um, Judith Merrill's, I think I sent you guys Judith Merrill's quote about Three Stigmata, where it was like a total outer, where she's like, on right? yeah. every other Tuesday, Philip K. Dick is a great writer. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, ouch. Um, but yeah, so that's, um, that's, I thought that was an interesting quote. So I don't know if anybody yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. Um, but it's also interesting to see what, uh, Theodore Sturgeon was saying about it. I mean, it's really, it's really easy to see how this book is a letdown to people. You know, yeah. it, it really does drop the, the story and go off in, a, another direction that you don't expect it to go into. And most people are not going to like that internal story. You know, just that's not, it's not what people want from science fiction, first of all. And it's, it, it's too disjointed to be uh, just classic. Mm. All these elements that make it, you know, it's totally understandable that people won't like it. But uh, like Dave's saying, you know, there's so many good things in there. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I can kick us off with like final... Teddy Sturgeon says there's so many good things in there. You know? Yeah. Um, I can kick us off with final thoughts and views. Um, yeah. I am going to give this book. Who? Let me see. I'm going to give it um, two Abraham Lincolns out of five. Um, or uh, final thoughts. Now, here's the thing. I would give it four out of five for just Dickhead's content, but for me, um, I think as a, as a experience for doing the podcast, 
I had a four star experience, but it's a, but when I was actually just sitting there reading the book, I was having what I consider to be a two star experience. <laughs> I do not think this is as bad. So like I despised cosmic puppets, right? And the longer I thought about cosmic puppets, I liked it less and less. Whereas we can build you, I appreciated things I was learning and things that were happening. The more I read about it, thought about it, the, the, the kind of um, epic um, publishing tirades with Ted White were entertaining um, and those things. So um, I enjoyed the process of doing this for the podcast. But if I wasn't doing it for the podcast, I would have had a hard time finishing this book be honest yeah yeah that's understandable um and so next i would say anthony go oh man so i'm gonna give it three and a half insufferable uh simulacrum creators out of five uh i think that your enjoyment of this book is totally contingent on how interested you are in Dick and Dick's process and how Dick works through things and Dick's uh, personal life and how that weaves in and out of his fiction. Cause well, yeah, this is definitely feels very autobiographical. A lot of the other books we've read are, are still kind of autobiographical, like clans of the alpha and moon. I feel like is me just being like, yep, dude, I get it. You're, you're, you're having a divorce and you're pissed off. Um, but for me, as somebody who is very interested in Dick, who's doing the podcast, it's it's incredibly interesting. This conversation kind of bumped it up for me a little bit. And I, I, I just think that, like Dave was saying, this isn't for the novice Dick reader. This is for somebody who's much more interested in, in PKD than your average person who's like, I just want to read um, some pulp sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I think I think there's value in this book, even if I didn't like the way he handled the, that last twenty pages. So yeah, three three and a half out of five for me. Holy shit! Do you realize what just happened? You were what, more I gave a positive book about a book than I was. <laughs> That's shocking. It's usually the other way around. I know. Yes, it has happened before, but a few times, but but rare on this podcast. Uh, so Dave Gill. Um, right. I, I think I know how many stars you're going to, or how, oh, many, how many stars am I going to give it? Well, I don't know. See, I was thinking <laughs> you might give it, um, I was thinking you'd probably give it, uh, uh, five out of five. Um, oh geez. Um, no, no. Sam Burroughs secretaries. Um, I agree with your assessment of a two out of a five in terms of the novel experience. Let me elaborate, though. <laughs> I don't think any <laughs> fair-minded critic could call this book successful. Like, that it accomplishes what it promises its reader, what it owes its reader. It's not successful. Um, but but you've read it you, six times. Exactly. Now, you guys, some of you are writers. Does your personal life infect and influence your art? Of course. Of course it does. And so, and, and, some, and, and that can be both a good and a bad thing, right? <laughs> like it can be really good because it can add this vividness and, and vivi vitiate the work, but it can also like make you not trust your instincts. You don't know what to do because you're emotionally involved in the story as well, right? Well, that's, been, that's been the hot topic of, of writer Twitter for the last week with the, with the cat person. So... So from, so think about like all of these great art, let's think about Hemingway, Fitzgerald, those two guys. And, we'll, and let's add just a couple, Miles Davis and, and Jimi Hendrix. These are geniuses who are troubled. Hendrix, not so much, right? But these are guys who struggle and part of the engagement with their art is hearing the real life feelings that these guys are going through as transmitted through their art. And so from that regard, in that way, this is a really powerful piece of art because it's resonating with all of the emotional drama of Dick's life while he's writing it. And here's the ironic part. I would argue that the fact that it kind of goes off the rails, almost, it almost 
legitimizes it in a way because that going off the rails is what happens when you're obsessed. It's what happens when you lose your ability to understand the proportion of things. Um, and it suggests like, this is a novel where Dick wanted to suffer on the page in this, in like a kind of a high art way. And I'm, I'm, I'm there for it. I'm there for it. So I don't think he pulled it off, but like, I can't, I can't, I also can't pull away from it because I see it's, it's, it's the gateway. It's another signpost on this road to this destination that, transform my life and I can't stop thinking about and it's, you know, become a singular focus in my existence. So, which is why go. we invited you to be on this episode because we I'm not suitable for much else. <laughs> not much else I can do with all of these opinions and knowledge. <laughs> so we have two segments to left me. after this. So Larry, take us home. What are your, what's your final? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I have a question again. Uh, what's with the statutory rape stuff? Because it, it's she's eighteen. I checked the law. There is no no law in any of those states that says anything about. Was there in the nineteen sixties? No, no. Huh. In so, fact, if you, go, if you go back in history, the age just goes down and down, not up. So there's, a, there's extrapolation at work here. Dick is extrapolating something about the laws of the future that don't exist yeah. in this time. Yeah. I yeah. hadn't thought about that. Yeah, so I, I just thought that was a weird sort of stretch on his part. Uh, <laughs> but as far as uh, rating, I, I, can give this, I can give this maybe a pair of uh, weird bathroom murals. Uh, <laughs> It's a. Uh, it's got some great stuff. I I really wanted it to be sort of a, um, like a Cheers or Moonlighting sort of uh, will they won't they kind of kind of book at the beginning there because that's what it was looking like, you know you got this this crazy girl this crazy guy and they're they're button heads at every turn but you can tell they're attracted to each other, so it was a it was great and then the the simulacra were amazing characters. I liked the characters. Everything was going well. Uh, and then there's this section in there where it's sort of, I can't remember which part it is exactly, but there's a part where, where Louis just grates. He just starts grating on me. And I, I was like, what the, I just can't. Every word that's coming, that's on the page makes me want to fight something. I just want to punch something in the throat. And uh, from that point on, I, I mean, I got back into the story, but that section really just, just took me out of the whole thing and not in like, oh, I have a moment where, you know, I sort of lost my, my, uh, my reality inside the book. No, I, I wanted to burn the thing. It was so bad. Uh, so I can't, I, it's, not, it's not the greatest book. I enjoyed a lot of it. I especially like the, the psychological stuff and the uh, relationships and that's it. that's what it gets it gets to all right so we have two segments left um we were going to talk about what we would do if we were hired by electric sheep productions to uh adapt this into film uh, welcome to we shamelessly ask for writing jobs on our podcast <laughs> um uh does anybody else want to go first? Because um, I do have I ideas. Know. I thought Tom Cruise yeah, would, I would be Louis. <laughs> we all know I'm going to cast uh, Michael Shannon as Maury Rock. So uh, I think what I would do is actually do a limited TV series for this and uh, weave in – I might do a little bit different. I might weave in a lot of Dick's fictional life so we could do kind of a, an on-the-screen – pseudo autobiography of dick and also extend the story of the two simulacrums way farther than it goes uh but i but i think it would be fun to have it as a tv show done by the people who did halt and catch fire who managed to take a subject i'm absolutely not interested in and make it a fun drama and almost a thriller to watch so that's how i would do it 
All right. Um, I would lean into the uh, Do Androids Dream prequel things. And, oh, yeah. You totally yeah. have that, too. Yeah, I would do it as a... I mean, I would do it as a very unfaithful um, prequel to Blade Runner with the... Blade Runner 1949. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with the, Founding of the um, of of Rosen, like being at the heart of these first simulacra, the and then his relationship being at the heart, like his obsession with Press being at the um, obsession point that kind of leads to this this company like exploding and becoming a thing, and that um, in the early days of the colony worlds like that the simulacra kind of take on more important meaning and see the start the beginning of the the and this is where it gets unfaithful because i would be focusing on like the the slavery aspects of the replicants and how that they're eventually going to become this thing to to kind of start the seeds of what would happen to blade runner and you do this on uh, like, first of all, I wouldn't want this to happen. I wouldn't suggest this to happen. I'm just saying if somebody came to me and said, David, we're going to do this regardless. Do you want the job to write it? This this is how I would pitch it to them. And if they said yes or no, I wouldn't care. Um, but, and I'm not saying that that's a faithful adaptation of We Can Build You, but that's the only way I see it working as a as a, as a film, to be honest, and who would I get to direct? I would. I'd probably choose. I'd probably try to get some hotshot uh, director who's been doing lots of TV pilots to try and give them their first break as a as a director. So I'm going to go with. Um, I can't remember her first name, but her last name is Culpepper. She's done a lot of the Star Trek. Uh, she did the Picard pilot. Yeah. Um, and she did a really good job of making. Um, her episodes of Discovery and Picard look cinematic and um, on a TV scale. And so I would give her the job of making a Blade Runner prequel. And um, I would have a fucking killer soundtrack by ELP, who did the soundtrack to Capone last year. Like a real crazy synth soundtrack. Uh, Gil, uh, Dave, what have you got? Would, how would you do this as a film? Well, I like my ending. If I were going to do the story, I'd, I'd append that ending to it. I don't know. I like the idea of, like, the warehouse where all these simulacrums are being made. And, like, so then there's, you know, whatever, Charles Darwin and, uh, whatever, you know, uh, Zelda Fitzgerald and, uh, you know, Amelia Earhart. And they're all... And they're all in there kind of like John and jabbering at each other and like they get farmed out to weird uh, you know like uh, dog and pony shows essentially you could do a really funny scene where Rosen's like drinking at a bar like really upset about how everything's going and Bundy just sends him like some hilarious like historical figure to go drink with him and he just like turns around and there's Darwin you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I yeah, know. I mean, I, th I like what you said earlier about Dick being funny, and it, it, this isn't a particularly funny book, and it is a sign of, a, of some mental illness while he was writing. Hey, uh, uh, funny right uh, now. Yeah. Larry. Uh, well, first of all, it's a romantic comedy, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, but it's sort of like short circuit, but instead of, you know, a number five alive, it's Abraham Lincoln. So it's basically short circuit with Abraham Lincoln and two fucked up people. So that's how I see it. As a, it's, a, it's a love triangle with uh, Chris oh, no, and, a, and Louis. You know, uh, or it's like, a, what is the movie where Einstein gets the two kids together, you know, the, that may, helps them fall in love? I is that young know. Einstein with Yahoo Serious? No. <laughs> Great movie, but no. No, it's uh, got Tim Robbins in it and, like, Meg Ryan or something. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, Abraham Lincoln helps them fall in love because they're way fucked up and they, do, they can't do it on their own. That's how I see it. That's how I, I see that for a dollar. And, uh, but it still has all those elements of the simulacra, and I like the idea of actually using the, uh, the factory. And, and uh, oh, that's one thing we didn't talk about is that 
is it, this is also where he got the teachers for Martian time slip, right? The what? The teachers, the, the oh. robot instructors. Yeah. He wrote this after or before, before. Martian time slip. So there's another connection that I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, and as far as I, I, I like David's idea of director, get someone new, you know, have it, have it be a young director that wants to make something interesting. And a couple of young stars, you know, up and coming stars that need that, that uh, romantic comedy cred that everyone has to go through in order to be a leading person. And, well, and so your just... version, Larry, would have in the trailer, would have a moment when they're like, like, I'm never going to get the love of my life unless I get the help of, and then they, there's a record scratch. Yeah. And then <laughs> Lincoln standing there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, geez. Oh, man. Uh, the guy that played Abraham Lincoln in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter or whatever it was, that guy should play Abraham Lincoln in this one. Not Daniel Day. You don't think you don't think Daniel Day Lewis is going to come in on this one? Yeah, he's not. He's not. Not good enough. I need the guy from uh, the Vampire Killer one. <laughs> <laughs> With the Russian director. Yeah. All right. <laughs> on that note. Um, Larry, what is your dick-like suggestion? And then we're done. <laughs> uh, uh, so first I want to mention that uh, Love, Death, and Robots has uh, their second set of short films out now. And I believe they're working on the third series. So that was a, a dick-like suggestion from a long time ago. And I have two. Uh, one I'll talk about real quick. Bo Burnham inside. Bo Burnham in Inside is basically a dick protagonist. Because he talks about That's on my list already. I just wonder. being so fucked up and not being able to handle the world as it is. And it's got some some great uh you know how Dick comes up with those great lines every once in a while, those just really powerful sort of uh metaphors and stuff. And uh and I have a couple written down here in, uh, in a couple of uh, Bo Burnham songs. He says stuff like, you say the ocean's rising like I give a shit. You say that the whole world's ending, honey, it already did. It's kind of a good line. Uh, and then there's another song where he says, 20,000 years of this, seven more to go. So he's really defeatist and, uh, and sort of like just hates everything. So, and including himself. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, and the other one is a movie called Come True that came out a couple of years ago. And it's about a teenager who is having problems at home. She joins a sleep study and they're studying uh, sleep paralysis. And so I don't know if any of you have ever had sleep paralysis. I get it all the time. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you, you see monsters and stuff and it's very real and scary and great, but, uh, and it sucks. Yeah. It sucks at the same time, but I really like it. It sucks a, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. I don't, but all right. Uh, my favorite was, uh, one time I had a guy in full suit of, of like medieval armor come in my back door and walk towards me when I had my back to the door. It's great. Sounds awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, but so it's about, but there's levels of reality in this. There's everyone, of course, private worlds because they're going into people's dreams and seeing what they're dreaming about. And there's also a sort of on the nose reference in there to this book, to We Can Build You. When they're in a library, and uh, the main character is looking at We Can Build You and, and the other main character is like, hey, you should read that book. It's really good. <laughs> That's, so I thought it was appropriate for this episode. Okay, uh, Anthony, do you have anything this month? Yeah, so I'm going to recommend 1955's The Revelation of Dr. Modesto by Alan Harrington, uh, which I'm just going to do a real quick pitch uh, on it Basically, the main character is this very troubled, sad, miserable kind of protagonist. 
and he finds this ad in the paper that says, hey, are you unhappy, uncomfortable, on edge all the time? Well, it's probably because you're a failure. And if you follow my program, uh, I can teach you how to, you know, be happy. And basically the whole point, like it, it's the process of becoming happy under this centralism is the idea of if you're too different and too unique, you're going to be miserable forever. So the program teaches you how to basically become so boring and so banal that everyone will love you and life will just work out because you're not, you're no longer a unique person. You've assimilate, assimilated into the herd and life is going to be great. Uh, and it, it doesn't work out. The character becomes so conflicted between this is who I should be. This is what I want to be. And he totally like loses his identity in this very strange, surreal Dickian way. And nice. so, yeah. Uh, the Revelations of Dr. Modesto from 1955, which has this killer cover, by the way. That is great. And uh, I, I found out about it by listening to Nicole Cushing's Forgotten Lore YouTube channel. And it just seemed, you know, she talked about how bleak it was. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds like something I'd read. So <laughs> I checked it out and I thought it was great. Sounds I good. finally had a recommendation, you guys. I know. Okay. I'm very yeah. happy. Um, uh, Dave, do you, do you have something or should I go? Well, I, my, my kid recommended a TV show called Infinity Train, which is an animated Great series, show. Yeah. and it has some, a lot of very Dickian elements to yeah. it, about <laughs> karma and dharma and uh, sort of working out your inner problems using a sort of futuristic sci-fi framework. Uh, um, and the episodes are really short, which yeah. I, really, I really like. That's, it it goes, goes by really fast. Yeah, that would be my recommendation. Plus that, uh, that gray flannel thing you were talking about. Earlier. Oh, yeah, the man in the gray flannel suit is a book by Sloan Wilson from the 1950s. And it's a, just a, it's a very, you can see why they made a movie out of it. It's a very well-produced novel that has a super mainstream plot arc to it. But the way that it um, metaphorically talks about the sort of decay and social drying up of, of modern society is spot on uh, Dickian and very influential in his career. I'm definitely going to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, totally good one to call me on. on. Yeah, um, so I have two. I'm going to go short on one and, uh, well, I'll go short on both. But um, the best of Judith Merrill. Um, and Judith Merrill is, she was a really important figure in the early pulp days of science fiction. She was um, an anarchist, progressive, um, radical science fiction writer who grew up with the whole Futurians, Isaac Asimov, Frederick Paul crew in New York. She ended up leaving the United States over the Vietnam War and became a Canadian citizen after the late 60s. And she left behind the largest collection of science fiction in the world to the uh, Toronto Library. Um, she edited all kinds of anthologies and stuff. And she also pissed off one Philip K. Dick by cutting out his first story, Rogue, from the uh, best of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction collections that she was editing. That's a good and, story. I'll, I'll post that, uh, well, that a link for that one. Another collection, two collections today, The Glassy Burning Floor of Hell by two-time guest Brian Evanson, um, which is will be out by the time this episode airs, August 3rd, so you should order it. Um, this is a very climate change and like environmental destruction themed anthology. It wasn't intended to be, but it just kind of turned out that way. There is some surreal horror, like there's a story about um, a captain of a ship, it's not sure, clear if it's a spaceship or a boat, whose um, fake leg becomes a murderer, so <laughs> that's great stuff. Um, but the two best stories are, there's a story in there called To Breathe the Air and a story called Nameless Citizen that um, are very Dickian and um, two of the best stories in this collection, but Anybody who's ever read Brian Evanson, he, I think he's, he's the best short story writer um, going right now. Like, I don't think anybody's, like, doing better short fiction than him. So I would recommend... Well, I would, say, I would say him and Cody Goodfellow are probably two of the top short story writers, but... 
I'd say at me all day, David at me all day. Uh, but the Brian Evanson, the, uh, and what a title, the glassy burning floor of hell is a great title. Um, and everyone should pick it up. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, (laughs) Anthony, what are we doing next time? Jason Taverner, world famous talk show host and man about town wakes up one day to find that no one knows who he is, including the vast databases of the totalitarian government. And in a society where lack of identification is a crime, Taverner has no choice but to go on the run with a host of shady characters, including crooked cops and dealers of alien drugs. But do they know more than they're letting on? And just how can a person's identity be erased overnight? Uh, For my tears, the policeman said, which is one that I think, Anthony, it's, you're the only one it'll be a first time read for because uh, Larry and I have read before, so. Yep. Um, this was one of the earliest Dick no- I think this was the second Dick novel I read, so. Yeah, it's somewhere around there for me, too. Yeah, so, um, and it's a great one, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, all right, uh, uh, before we go, uh, Mr. Gill, um, tell folks how they can find you. Oh, well, they can go on the Total Dickhead, read a bunch of stuff I wrote a long time ago, or uh, <laughs> uh, where else can they go? I don't know. Just Google my name, David Gill and Philip K. Dick. Most of my stuff is at the... Is at the uh, um, blog, but you can read my introduction to Ann Dick's memoir published by Tachyon uh, in search of Philip K. Dick. You can read my footnotes in the uh, exegesis published in 2012. And uh, you can find my intro to the short story collection, The Best of Philip K. Dick. So here you go. Not that I don't get paid for any of those, but that's where you can <laughs> find me. <laughs> Uh, well, dude, it was an honor to have you on the show for a second appearance. Um, oh, glad to be here. I'm sure we'll have you back in some form or another at some point. Yeah, there's a couple more novels I'd really like to, to talk about. Yeah, I think when we get to the Vels trilogy, I think... There you go. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. But, you know, we don't have that much left. We're actually... Yeah. We've been doing this for three years now, and we're, we're, we're around in the... We're around in the past. So. Well, yeah, you stopped publishing five books a year around now. <laughs> yeah, well, right. those, yeah, those six out a little. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. Uh, good work, guys. And uh, so for the listeners, if you made it this far, uh, you're awesome. And uh, keep it paranoid. Stay yep, paranoid. Bye. Bye. Bye.